Hello. Starting up the streams. Ah, I keep getting transcoding options. So lucky. Hello, this is stream number 424. I uh, am testing my WebSockets implementation in Rust using the Autobahn test suite. So yesterday I did client side testing. Now I'm going to do server side testing. All right, so I am ready to test this. I actually had to figure out how to run Autobahn test suite in server mode to t or in client mode to test my server. I figured that out. And it had to do with... Actually, how do I show this without having two folders? Hmm. What if I just dump it out on the terminal here? Cat client.sh. Yeah, okay, so that that works. So the command that they tell you in their git repo... Near the top? No, maybe near the middle? Yeah, near the middle for the Autobahn test suite right here. This runs it in server mode, so it'll test your client connecting to it. So it took me a little bit to figure out how to run it in client mode. Okay, there's 715209. How are you today? To run it in client mode, com I combine the information from here with what they have listed down here as a deprecated? Where do they say this? They say the following recipe still works, but the new recommended way is you to use the Docker. So it, this led me to believe that everything below here, talking about WS test, was old. When they say it still works. It turns out that I believe their Docker image uses this W test internally. So what I did on the command line here to have it not run the default server, but to run the client, is I added a few things. I added this command here, the W test on the Docker image rather than the default command. Then we have to tell it to do fuzzing client mode, and then we also have to tell it where to find the config file. I believe by default, then they must have ws test dash m fuzzing server dash s config fuzzing server dot json. Hey there, Uber Unix and JT. Uber Unix is second in the channel today, and JT is number three. Uh, what happened to my chat? Do I need to reset my chat? Where is my chat overlay? Oh, I'm on the wrong scene. <laughs> I was on the scene that I use when I'm recording for YouTube, which doesn't show my chat. There we go. <laughs> so you can see now, 715209 was first, Uber Unix second, JT third. Yeah, I'm like, wait a minute, where's the chat? <laughs> okay, anyway, running this uh, script to run it in client mode does the same thing as the server mode, only it actively tries to connect to us. Since I'm not running my Echo server yet, it fails and then bombs. So I need to actually set up a uh, an example that's going to run it in, in as a server. So I'm going to... To start, I think, by taking the Autobahn client and duplicating it. We call this one Autobahn server. All right. And then I need to change the program so that instead of actually reaching out and connecting to a server, it just needs to run as a client, as a server. So uh, I want to use, I'm, I'm following the same convention that um, Tungstenite did. In their example, they run their server as 9002, and when they are in client mode, they uh, connect to the testing server as 9001. So they they use two different port numbers. So I'm going to do the same thing. Uh, I need to look at this one. I'm using the same general configuration that Tungstenite uses. So we're setting up our server to run on port 9002, and then I also had to put 9002 for... Um, what we tell the docker to um, to punch through their firewall. Okay, so that's why I'm putting 9002 here. I suppose since we're running locally always, I'll just put 127001 here. I had the other, the the um, 
explicit IP address in there when I was connecting to between two machines, but after the stream yesterday, I changed it so that we're now running localhost for a fair comparison. Hey there, Lentil Stew Dragon. And a Dylan Valorant noob. Hello, how are you two? I'm going to wave to you. All right. Thank you for the follow also. So the program is going to run tests. Actually, we don't need this agent, it turns out. That's another thing I noticed. So we're going to run the tests using this as the default URI for our server. Actually, I don't even need that either. I just need to know what port number to use. So port it is which is a U16, and the default value is going to be 9002. And then this is going to be port. So the run test only needs to know the port number, which is a U16. It doesn't need to be generic anymore. So there's no where clause needed. Am I using Linux? You guessed it. I was wondering if anyone would catch that. Here is my Windows VS Code. And here is my Linux VS Code. Can you tell the difference? There's a very subtle difference. Well, you can probably see from the top, the um, title bar is different. I believe that's because I'm using Sigwin X and I don't have it set up to have VS Code using its custom bar. So it's using the uh, default bar that's provided by uh, Sigwin X. A little bit. <laughs> the font should be the, exactly the same, though. So uh, if I like show Autobahn client on both screens, it, it should look pretty similar if I scroll to the same position. Like, it's the same font, right? Well, uh, okay, so the, the pixel is, pixelization of the font is slightly different. So it looks a little sharper for Linux than it does on Windows. But I think it's because on Windows it's... Win the Windows um, Display Manager is displaying the font slightly differently, but it should be the same font family and size and everything. Yeah, so I um, figured I'd be working on Linux today because I want because the uh, Autobahn test suite runs as a Docker image, and it's much easier for me to run Docker on my Linux box. And then if we're going to do a fair apples to apples comparison, then I should get the network out of the way. So we're just running on localhost. And so that means my uh, code needs to run in the Linux box as well. What am I coding now? And I'm not in a VM. It's actually another machine off on the side here. And I'm connecting over the network using a Sigwin X server. Hey there, lazy guru. Yeah, today what I'm going to be doing is I'm taking some code I wrote in Rust that implements WebSockets, and I'm going to test it with the Autobahn test suite. So if you want to know more about the Autobahn test suite, that you can find here. I did not write the Autobahn test suite. The fine folks at Crossbar.io, I don't know how to pronounce that, but they made it for their implementation of WebSockets. And it's actually used, uh, they proclaim, proclaim a long list of implementations of WebSockets that use their test suite for testing. So maybe someday we can add, yeah, they can't keep up. <laughs> I noticed Tungstenite is not in the list. And of course, my stuff isn't on the list either because I haven't published it yet. So we are, we're going to use this. They provide a Docker image. They even tell you what command to run to run the uh, fuzzing server. We're going to run the fuzzing client today because they ran the fuzzing server yesterday. Hey there, develop it. Every time you want to go to bed, you receive a message in Discord that I'm live. <laughs> Does that mean we're like out of phase 180 degrees? When I wake up and start working, you go to bed? Sorry about that, develop it. I just have to move to Europe or something. You're studying software development, so sorry if you sound dumb, but what is a WebSocket? WebSocket, that's a great question. Let me give you another link. WebSocket RFC. It's an internet standard. So it has an RFC. And I will just go through the abstract. So it's a protocol. It enables bi-directional, in other words, two-way communication between two computers, right? A client running untrusted code in a controlled environment to a remote host that has opted in to communications from that code, in other words, a server. Uh, let's skip the front matter and talk about the introduction. So it's something that came out of the use of HTTP, that HTTP is a protocol that, you know, use in a web browser to fetch web pages, right? Uh, 
like they're saying here, that whenever you need bi-directional communication between like a web browser and a server, HTTP wasn't really designed for that. So over the years, people have innovated and, and to a point where you have to abuse the protocol to like keep pinging the server. Like, server, do you have anything to say? Server, do you have anything to say now? Because traditional HTTP, the client makes the requests, and the server waits for a request and sends a reply. So if the server has something to say and the client doesn't ask the server, there's no way for the client traditionally to tell the server what it has to say. So polling is one way to get around that. WebSockets is designed to kind of clean up that that mode of communication provide a truly bi-directional. So in other words, the, if the server has something to say, you can go ahead and say it to the client and the client doesn't have to ask first. It is very similar to a transport layer like TCP, you might have heard of, where it's uh, you, you make a, a handle in your program. It's a special handle called a socket. Instead of um, the handle being used to write data to a file, you use it to send data over the network. So a WebSocket is like that only it begins its life as a connection used for HTTP, and you go through the upgrade process that's built into HTTP to switch the protocol from HTTP to WebSocket. But once you get there, it's pretty much just a byte pipe, a message pipe that can go in either direction. You can send text, you can send binary, you can ping and pong to make sure the connection is still alive. That's basically it. There's a little bit of framing protocol junk on top of that, so when you see a diagram like this, don't be terribly scared. But you can put anything you want in this payload data. It could be a hello world. It could be a file, whatnot. And then there's this what's known as a header placed in front of every piece of your payload to kind of mark like the opcode marks whether or not it is a text or binary or something else like a ping. And uh, we encode the length of the payload. And then there's this masking that's done to um, prevent poisoning HTTP uh, proxy servers, which I won't go into because it's too complicated. But um, that's it. <laughs> no problem. I am here for a couple different reasons, right? I'm doing this coding as just personal growth and, and hobby and that kind of thing. But I'm also here streaming it to uh, show it to other people so that then when they have ask, uh, questions to ask me, I can be there to explain it. Uh, I'm also doing what's known as rubber ducking. So if I show you that term. Uh, yeah, let's look at the Wikipedia article, not the Urban Dictionary. They, it's, it's, it's more commonly known as deep rubber duck debugging where it... it if you read about this, it talks about how if you can explain to a rubber duck sitting next to you while you're programming, if you can explain to it what you're doing, then just uh, the act of explaining kind of helps you gain confidence that you know what you're talking about. So I'm, be do I'm going to be doing that a lot in my stream, uh, talking about my code and talking about the protocol to verify that I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Red Rampage Crumpet, you've been here for a whole year and you haven't left? I'm impressed. <laughs> Hey there, Utsby, by the way. It's a kind of tube, yes. <laughs> you actually do have a Frankenstein monster rubber duck on your desk? Wow, nice. <laughs> it's just an expression, really. I'm going to be um, partially here to explain things because it verifies that I know what I'm talking about. And if, if I say something wrong, you can correct me. So um, that's one of the benefits of streaming. Of course, the other side of streaming is it's a little bit more stressful. So I'm going to try to manage that best I can. And thank you again, Red, uh, Red Rampage Crumpet. Okay, so given that we are we are um, making a WebSocket connection, or basically a connection to a web server that allows us to talk in both directions, really briefly, our overview of what we did before is, I guess we can show it here. No, let's show it in the one that's still working, right? So the idea of running the client-side tests is that uh, basically here, we are going to make an HTTP client, and then we're going to use it to ask the server, how many test cases are there? And we're going to print that out. And then we're going to loop for all of the test cases. We're going to run the test case. Running the test case it involves printing the test case number, connecting to the web server, and saying we want to run a certain test case. Okay? And... 
then when we connect to the server, because it's a WebSocket connection, we're going to get back a, um, a, a bidirectional object that we immediately split into the two parts. Sync is what we use to send messages, and stream is what we use to receive messages. And this is more of a Rust terminology. I'm using the Rust programming language, by the way. So in Rust, a sync is a kind of a, a channel. In other words, it's, uh, an ob it's a value that we can send items to, one after the other, and each one is then transported somewhere else. In this case, it's going to be transported to the server through the WebSocket. Whereas a stream is the other direction. A stream is the same kind of thing. It's like a channel or an iterator. There's various words to explain it. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tunnel or a pipe from which we're going to receive messages from the server over the WebSocket. So the terminology in Rust for that kind of thing is either a map or a for each, or you can have a for loop, you know, various ways to do it. This is a kind of a loop where it's done using a, um, a function. It's like a functional way of doing a loop. Basically, you're saying, take the stream, and then for each message you receive from the stream, do this with it. And what we do is we're going to uh, do a match, which is like a C switch statement, only a little bit more powerful. We're going to take the message and match it against different patterns. So if it's a ping or a pong or a text message, it says we're going to take the sync and then get access to it to send a text message where the payload of the message is the same as the message we just received. And we're going to send it as a one chunk. Instead of um, making it into separate fragments, it's going to, the, the first fragment is going to be the last. For binary messages, it's a similar thing, only we have to send it as a binary. Oh wait, I misspoke up here. It's not if it's a ping pong or a text. If it's a ping or a pong, we do nothing with it. This is the do nothing. <laughs> if it's a text, we send it back as a text. If it's a binary, we send it back as a binary. If it's a close, we look at the code where we got, and if it's a special 1005 code, you can look that up in the RFC. It's a special code that means there is no code or no status. We will send back a no status close. Otherwise, we send back a close with the status. The difference between these is when you close a WebSocket, you can give the other end a reason why you're closing. Or you can just simply close and say, you know, thanks, but no thanks. We don't want to talk to you anymore. We're not going to say why. So um, there are two variants of that. Anyway, when they close, we close. That's essentially what this says. And I wasn't sure about this. I left it in here that if we um, send a close, we're probably not going to send anything more because such a thing would be illegal so we close the sync after we send the close this close on the sync says to the sync we're done we're not sending any more all right so that's essentially it if i go deeper and show you like what a connect is this gives you more insight about how a websocket actually works if we're a client there is a handshake process that requires us to, to participate in two steps the first step is to begin and the open of the websocket I'll go into that in a second, but I have a type we developed last week called the WebSocket Client Builder. It gives us back a builder value and a request value. So this is an HTTP request. So it fills in basically all of the things that are required from a WebSocket client to do other than things that it doesn't know about, like the actual location of the server. In other words, the... Um, the identifier about where it is, the, un the uniform resource identifier, the URI, right? So the URI, for example, looks like this. The scheme is not HTTP, but WS to mark that we're going to upgrade to the WebSocket protocol. We're not going to just simply do an HTTP request, right? This is the IP of the address of the server. That's my local address of my Linux box, and that's the port number we're connecting on, right? So this needs to match what I have set up for the fuzz server. That's why I have it there. But I make it so that we can override it if we want. And then um, once we set, where am I? Uh, go up to connect. There's a little bit of lag because I'm over um, X Windows network connection, but it's not too bad. After we fill in that URI, then we're going to tell the client to fetch that, or to use that request to fetch a response. This is what this says. But with the caveat that we will would like to upgrade the connection to the WebSocket protocol. That's what that means. So uh, these are all asynchronous, by the way, which means that this fetch may take a while. So it's also asynchronous. So we need to, we need to wait for it in, 
we, which we can do in Rust if we're inside of an asynchronous function, what an await does is it basically sets a checkpoint that says we could temporarily return from here and then when the what's called the executor, which runs tasks, uh, says uh, is signaled that it's time to wake up and try again, we'll essentially re-enter the function at this point rather than at the top and retaining all the state that we had from before. But So basically all of the th variables we have are secretly stashed away in the structure somewhere and then pulled back out, essentially. Um, you can think of it that way. Um, at this point, when we re-enter and we've gotten the request, right? It could have errored out. If we do, we're going to package it into a special error value and return it. That's what this question mark is. It's a nifty little thing. If a function ha returns a result, result is a value that says it could either be success, in, in which case we get a WebSocket, or fail, in which case we get an error. Question mark says if it fails, then return the failure condition with the error in it, right? But if it is successful, take the success alternative of the result and just make that the value of the expression. In other words, give it to the match, right? So the match, if it's a success, uh, the, the fetch will be basically, if I, if I look at, if I hover over that, you can see that it returns a result of fetch results or an error. So success means we get a fetch results, right? If the fetch results contains a response where the status code is 101, then we're going to successfully try to um, complete the WebSocket handshake. This is another example of how in Rust you can do a pretty powerful kind of pattern match. You, can, you can't do this kind of thing in a switch case statement in C. This, this is essentially the saying that the fetch results has to not only be um, a, a successful, well, I should say, it not only has to have a response in it, but it has that response has to have a status code of 101, and we don't care about the rest of it, right? If we uh, have any other kind of fetch results of the response with a non-101 status code, it's unexpected because we expect it to be able to upgrade, right? So we're going to turn that into an error saying, we didn't expect that response, and here it is if you want to look at it. So given that we successfully upgrade to a WebSocket, the status code is 101, and then we um, make sure that we get the upgrade information out of that fetch results. If there wasn't any, we're going to say, hey, where is that upgrade information? It's an error unless we have it. <laughs> Sounds like request response rest stuff with sync stream. Might not be the same since you're unfamiliar with WebSocket. You essentially got it, JT. The HTTP stuff is request response rest. But once you get the 101 status code, the connection comes up in the protocol stack and is given to WebSocket in this case, right? The rest part is done. Now the connection becomes a live bidirectional thing that the WebSocket protocol is used to um, kind of keep... Um, what am I trying to say? The WebSocket protocol is then used to convey the information that's sent in either direction on the connection. So now it's no longer REST, it's more of a, I don't know what you call it, an active bidirectional pipe. And we're going to get it here, and we're going to immediately split it between the receiver and the transmitter end. And we're going to go back to that WebSocket builder that we told uh, early on to um, start open. We're going to do the second half of the client-side handshake, which is to say finish open. Take those two halves of the connection boxed up. Box is a way to say we're going to move it onto the heap so that it can be you know, locked in place in memory so it's safer to send between threads. It's a, it's a nifty little thing. And fill, um, what does this do? Oh, it checks to make, the make sure the response is good. And we also give it any trailing bytes that happen to be uh, captured after the end of the response. And if successful, we will get a WebSocket out. Of course, we might get an error, in which case we're going to map that error to a WebSocket error and return it. So hopefully, just ran through that whole thing. Hopefully it makes sense. Let me know if you have any questions. What is the at symbol? The at symbol is a way to say if this overall pattern matches, we want to take the thing after the at symbol and make it available through a local variable called whatever came before the at symbol. And I use that in uh, basically right here because finish open needs to borrow that result. Whenever you see an at an and an ampersand in Rust, it means I want to borrow that. I want to I want a, a a pointer 
to that, but I'm not going to own the thing it's pointed to. I just want to look at it, right? So finish open wants to look at the response. The response is buried inside of the fetch results. And so this says, I want to grab this inner part of the fetch results and name it response locally within the match arm. Uh, so I only use this a few times. It's a little bit obscure. Normally your patterns aren't very complicated. They will be something like, uh, let's look at a different kind of match. Something like this, where the m message itself is an enum. So if I show you the um, stream message, it's an enum. An enum is a list of variants. There are different things that the value could be. It could be a ping, it could be a pong. And then let's say it is a text. If it's a text, then there's a value associated with that text. And so the, the typical thing you'll see in a match with a simple enum is each arm is one of the alternatives of the enum, and you put a name in there to match the associated data, and you never you don't have to see the at sign because the entire structure is captured by that name. You only see the at sign when you're capturing a subset. So in this case, I am not capturing the entire uh, associated data with fetch results w because it's a structure, right? It has um, a response and an upgrade in it. So I don't need the upgrade to, um, uh, how do I say this? I, I The upgrade part covers the entire thing, but um, for the response, oh, okay, I need to walk back a little bit. If I didn't care about the status code, I could have just said, response like that, and it would have worked, right? Uh, this will compile just fine. The problem is this. It's going to say, wait a minute, these two arms match, uh, both match the same things. So when you want to capture something for the arm, but you want to also do a, um, a more focused match, uh, pattern match against it, you um, have to say both things. You have to say, not only do I want to name it response, but I want that response to match, uh, have a sub-pattern match. I think that's what it's actually called, a sub-pattern match. That this response has to match the sub-pattern where the status code is 101. Now that I, it took me like three times to explain that, and the first two times I didn't explain it correctly, hopefully now you can see how I ha still am learning, and um, but maybe I have it correct on the third try. I need to fix this little... Um, reflection of light behind me. So I'm going to be right back for about 10 seconds. Hold on a second. Sorry about that. I just, oh, it's still there. I need to close the other blind. Hold on. Hold on. I literally have to run across to the other side of the room to pull the blinds. And now the color key isn't quite right. You know, ever since I messed with the color key, it hasn't really been the same. <laughs> if I turn up the aggressiveness on it a little bit. It's just I don't... Here's what it looks like without the chroma key, because I have a blue screen behind me. Don't ask me why I have blue and not green. Uh... Because I'll just say, it's the same, right? It's just a different color. But I haven't... It's hard to get the color exactly right as the lighting condition changes throughout the day. There, that's my best attempt. Okay. And by the way, hello, Fluffy Squirrels 21. And hello, Sir Mordred. Let me catch up in chat in case I miss something. Finds that part of the match to a variable. So Fluffy Squirrels got it right. So I'm going to give you a point. If I'm right, would that mean data can continue to be transferred as a request or a response? Yeah, because this just gives a name to a piece of the of the um, of the value that was given to match up here, right? It doesn't mean we consume it here. In fact, we continue to use it. I can borrow it here. I can pull out the connection there. So it just binds certain parts of it to uh, variables. 
But you can think of it as this is destructured into the variable's response and upgrade, and it's also making sure that the response matches that sub pattern. All right, I need to take a little bit of water. Yesterday, I made yesterday I made the mistake of not refilling the water, and I ran out during the stream. <laughs> Really ought to read up on WebSockets. I wonder if WebSockets in one language is the same with other languages. Well, I can I can tell you between C++ and Rust, they were roughly the same. I like the fact that in uh, Rust, it kind of forced me to be safer in the concurrent processing. So since it's bidirectional, we have to both handle sending messages and receiving messages basically at the same time. And so unless you're really smart about multiplexing it, you're going to be doing some kind of concurrency, whether it's uh, a th threading or um, tasks on a queue or whatnot. And I, I like the way that the Rust language forced me to use their safe concurrency, whereas in, in C++, I just kind of threw a bunch of threads at it. <laughs> but um, because the protocol is language agnostic, you probably would end up implementing it the same general way. And the differences between the languages would be like, what are the, those languages strong at representing those concepts using? So like Rust is really good. If it's asynchronous, Rust has a strong foundation in um, channels and um, iterators. And so a lot of the, my implementation uses that. Whereas in C++, it just looks different. Okay, so I explained all this, right? I um, this, this works, we ran it yesterday. It tests our code in client mode, and I'm going to do the same thing in server mode. We need to change a few things though, right? Hold on a second, I need to cough. So my throat is so dry because it's like getting cold and we have to run our heater and it's so dry in here now. Yeah, even my, my what is that, a humidity sensor says it's pretty dry. <laughs> okay. Why am I getting an error for this? Expected a string? Why is it expecting a string? Oh, because it's parsed as a string. But it's still, it'll convert it to um, unsigned integer 16-bit, right? Okay. So instead of connecting to a server, we're eventually setting up a server, so all we need to know is what port number to use. So I no longer have a base URL I need to worry about. We're no longer getting a case count because we're going to be passively wait, awaiting connections. So we won't know how many test cases there are, and we're not going to be running a loop of test cases. So I think this all folds away, right? There is no agent. There's no case count or cases. Minimally, it's just going to be the port number. And instead of an HTTP client, we want an HTTP server. So there's no loop. I think this all ends up getting folded down to like this, right? We don't need to tell to update the reports. So we're going to run a test with that server and catch any errors and print them. We need to import the server. So we're changing client to server, changing this to server. Oh, I need to pull that crate in. So we pull in crates through cargo toml and, oh, I don't have the uh, plugin on Linux. I had a plugin we were using for, or extension we were using for Tomal, right? What was it? Anybody remember? Better Tomal, that's what it was. Better! Stronger! We want better Tomal, please. Oh, not better t Tink, better Tomal. Install that. Yay. This is a, really cool how you can just kind of grab an extension and go. So now my Tomal is nice and colored. We want Rimu Web Server, which is not published yet, so I have it local, locally in a sibling folder called HTTP Server, right? Make sure that that causes a cargo check, which should now have the language server know what we're talking about when we import it. And I don't think I have that variable. And I'm waiting for this to catch up. Do I need to reload? I might need to reload. Whenever I see this business, it's like the language server has fallen behind. What if we reload the language server? Reloads workspace. I think that did it. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to tell, though. 
Yeah, for that, but by the way, what I'm using is Rust Analyzer. I'm using this extension, which doesn't have as many downloads as the Rust extension, I think because Rust has a better name. But I really like this version of the uh, as Rust support in uh, VS Code. Okay, I'm going to scroll down to the bottommost error. So run test needs a server and a port. So this needs to be server, right? Actually, I can do this like this, right? Okay, it didn't preserve my capitalization. That's actually a different extension, right? Should I just, should I just pull in all the extensions I normally use? I think it's change case up. Updated? Is that the right one? That doesn't... No, there's a different one, right? Multiple cursor case preserve. That's what I want. I want... Multiple cursor case preserve. Yeah, that one, right? Yes. Making sure I get the correct one. Actually, while we're at it, I kind of want the other one, too. The, um... Where is it again? Change case. Updated. Change case update. Change case. Updated by H.J. Darnell, right? Yes. Install that. All right. Getting all the extensions I am used to using. All right, so we get a server and a port, correct? So this doesn't need to be generic anymore. Yeah, cold dryness sucks, yeah. It's dry because the heater, we run the heater, which dries out the air. Okay, so we, wait a minute, I don't need, to, I don't need this report, update reports. I'm in the wrong function. <laughs> I need to go to run test. Run test also doesn't need to be generic. It as a server and there see how I preserved the case of that server there that was that extension we installed so we need a port number u6 actually do i need this in i might as well uh, there's no case or okay so we don't print out a test case number all right and then i'm going to need a different kind of setup here right we're it's not going to be really connect it's going to be listen and Listen is going to set it up. It's going to set up the HTTP server. And then we're going to need to handle incoming connections. And every time we get one, we need to try to open it. As a, okay, so let's, let's say we need to do a listen on the server. I forget the syntax for that. And then this would be like, this whole thing would go into a resource handler, the way I have this set up. I should compare this to my example web server. Because we need to we need to do something similar to that. I called it Jeeves. So Jeeves Right registers a handler and then calls start. And then await runs the server to completion, correct? So I um would make run test do basically that. Have the server register uh what do we put for the path? What did they put for the path in um Tungstenite. If I go to their examples and I go to Autobahn server, what do they run for the URL? Except, actually, I don't know what URIs we're going to get. Maybe it doesn't matter and we just leave the path blank. Like that. Do I even need any of the? Well, I think I do. So that's basically an empty path. And then we're going to do, um, what? Handle test factory. Name it something. And then we need to start at the port number we were told. And this I added yesterday. It is so that in the future, if we need to wrap connections with TLS, we can do that here. Identity is a is a cool little function hardly ever used but it basically says don't wrap it basically return the value you're given so any connection that we get from the server will be unwrapped we'll not have any any tls around it uh, we'll do we'll do the tls later and i don't think i want this match essentially i just want to um 
Because start returns what we want, right? I basically just want to await that and return. Okay, and then the rest of that becomes what goes into handle test factory. So we'll end it there and we'll say, um, I need to look at what Jeeves did. How does it, how do we format the factory? Okay, we'll just grab the whole factory. I'll put it here. It's a synchronous function which yields a boxed future. That's what all this means. Okay, it looks like I had a type alias for that. So let's grab... Oh, that's in the server. Okay, so we can import that. Resource future. Okay. So let's do that. Uh, actually, I'm going to copy all this stuff. I want all this over here, don't I? At the top. Right here. Okay, and then there was something else I wanted to import. What was it? Down here somewhere. Oh, maybe not. Maybe not. So this right here is what we do with the connection. So I'm going to grab it and place it here. Uh, we need to figure out where it goes. It's going to go in there somewhere. Actually, now that I think about it, we might need to send it over a channel to a worker thread of some kind. Or do I? No, I, I do because we have to return the response and then after returning, take the connection and use it, right? So we're going to have to have some kind of other executor. We have to have some, uh, some context in which to, to actually run the WebSockets. Okay, so... So f maybe that maybe then it should go into its own function. So then what I was going to put into the factory here, I really should take it out and put it into another context. Some kind of asynchronous context, right? Yeah, let's do that. Let's define some kind of asynchronous context like uh, serve WebSocket. And it does that. And then I'll want to figure out what the types are. Okay, obviously it... Uh, we don't need to do this, right? We will probably be given a WebSocket and we'll need to split it. So we'll pass in the WebSocket. I think that's all I need, right? So we're going to immediately take the WebSocket, split it, and then process it. All right. Hey there, Strihex. How are you doing? I'm figuring out how to test the server side of my WebSocket code. We need to um, serve WebSockets now. Uh, this needs to be a function, right? So we get this asynchronous function to compile. Okay, it is except for this okay. Why? Oh, because I don't have a... Um, does, does it matter if we have a result? I don't think so because we don't ever have any error. So I'll just get rid of the okay at the end and we should be good, right? Yes, okay. So then... This should be exactly the same. Once we get a WebSocket, we're supposed to operate it the same way we did in client mode. Right? So, that means I can say that that's probably done and move on. So, I wanted to call that handle test factory. Okay, request is not imported. We need that from RhymaWeb. What's next? Um, why is this still here? I don't know, but that's probably old. I don't need get case count anymore. All right. Back to the handle test fact. Okay, so... I remember um, parts of what connect did need to go into the hand the test factory did you figure out the one second delay i did it was the name lookup for the uh server so i replaced it with an ip address and it, it gone just like that <laughs> so the one second delay was that it's some kind of problem in my the network setup on in uh right here in my house so for some reason when i i had instead of the ip address i had cheetah 
local. For some reason, it takes a second to con to 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 figure out the IP address from that. So just putting the raw IP address, so it's a I can show it because it's not a public IP. It's inside my house, right? Um, that that eliminated the one second delay. There were um, other optimizations I did later, and actually, it turns out my code beats Tungstenite on a lot of the performance tests. Not the fragmented messages one, but the raw throughput. We beat Tungstenite like by a fair margin. So I'm happy about that. Hi there, VV1ZM8. All right. I didn't recognize your name, but I think it's because we usually just say hi. I'm fine with that. All right. Let's see what I want to change here. Oh, I'm in the wrong place. I want to change the server server um, program example, not the client one. It's some kind of problem with. Well, I did switch to a new router, so maybe it's something wrong with the router. I have the router setup. I have. I also enabled IPv6. So maybe there's some kind of, maybe it tries IPv6 and it doesn't work right away and gives up. That actually could be it. It could be that it's trying to connect through IPv6 first and it takes a second for it to return that the connection is refused. And then it goes back to IPv4, so which, is which would explain why putting in an IPv4 address here gets it instantly because it won't try IPv6 first, right? That's probably what it is. Okay, parts of this connect we need, right? Okay, essentially, instead of doing a client builder, we want a server builder. So, let's go to server builder. Is there anything I can use out of connect? Not really, right? It's all different from that point on. Yeah, so I don't think we need, we actually don't need the connect anymore. I was keeping around in case there are things I could salvage from it. So instead, we have to go to web, uh, itchy nose, WebSocket server and say um, open. And then, uh, oh, we need to split the connection first. Uh, where did I, oh, I, I just deleted it. <laughs> I think we, uh, well, uh, let's just copy from the client again. Where is, was that split? Right here. We need to split the connection into the transmit and receive parts. So that is given to us there. Split it, and then we can take the request. And max range size, let's say there is none. And then that gives us back a WebSocket or an error, right? Oh, it gives us a WebSocket and a response. Or, or we could get an error. So what do we do on error? I suppose we close the connection, so it would just be um, if let some if let OK where WS and response equal that. Otherwise, it's going to just drop the connection, right? Um, what kind of thing do we need for this feature? We need a fetch results, which is the response connection on upgraded. Oh, this was for the client side, right? Let me think about this. I might be doing this wrong. I am doing this wrong. We're supposed to um, provide a callback that gives us the connection, and then we split it and make the WebSocket from it. So I'm doing this wrong. I don't want to actually split the connection here or open. We need this, but not here. Wait a minute. Do I have a chicken and the egg problem here? I need to get the response, but in order to get the response, I have to split the connection. But if I split the connection, I can't box it in the fetch results anymore. That's a problem, isn't it? <laughs> I did build release 715209. That's how we beat Tungstenite. What happened with the async server? It's fine. Uh, I finished it.
And hello, Bokjo. I could go over it in a bit if you want me to. But yeah, the async server is... is we're, we're building up the test for it right now, actually. Because I, I, I want to test it with Autobahn. So, um... But yeah, it looks like I have a design issue. If I need to do that to get the response in order to put it into the future... So this is essentially going to... Oh, we need to fetch results always. Oh, then I know I know how I want to do this. If we can't open it as a WebSocket, we should return like uh, 400 or something, or a 500 status code. So like... Um, Ah, itchy nose. Hold on. What are we going to do with the WebSocket then? Yeah, this is a problem. Do I need to... What do I do with that? I might have a problem with the... I need to... I might need to rethink how the web server works. So going back to Jeeves, right? We're supposed to take the request and turn it into a response and then return it. And if it ends up that we upgrade the connection, we're, we will be given the connection back um, through the on upgraded right here, this callback. There's where we get the connection back. But the way I have the WebSocket stuff designed, uh, we will end up with a WebSocket right away. Where do I put that? I need to go into the how how I design this. Hold on a second. <laughs> I had to blow my nose. What does Dyn mean? That some type implements a trade next to it? Yes, basically. This says the box has a pointer to some type that the type must implement this trait. This is actually a collection of traits. This is a little trick I learned. If you want the thing in the box to implement multiple traits, what you can do is you can make a, um, a, a super trait, or is, this, is that the right term? You make a trait that is constrained by all the traits you want, and then you do a blanket implementation, a blanket generic implementation that says um, to um, implement all of these that for any t that implements these types implement our connection tx trait for it so like you need both of these lines that one and the one above it this one packages together four different traits one of them being a lifetime trait and then this one says any type that implements all of those traits will um, we'll give an implementation for this um this so that it will um meet the um condition uh, that box requires here uh gosh i might be kind of stuck here because this requires the connection why does it require the connection actually let me go into this why do we need the connection Technically, I don't. This just stashes it, right? Oh, no, the new runs the web, the worker, right? Okay, so that's the problem. The, um, when we, the moment we create the WebSocket, it needs the connection. So this is premature, though. I think we can't do that. I think I need to break the, um, open, the server builder into two pieces again. But then still, I still have a problem where, um, uh, what is it? Where was I? Right, that what we return, this fetch results, we're only going to be given back... Oh, wait, no, I know what we're going to do. The callback we can provide can capture the builder. That's what I'm going to do. But I do need to change the um, builder, because we can't do it in one shot with open. So let's envision that I had a start open for this as well. And it didn't take the connection. It just took the request and didn't give us a WebSocket back yet. It just gave us a response, right? Let's imagine that I had that. 
if that was okay, then we would um, return a uh, fetch results, which has a response in it. We have to provide the connection back. We can't split it yet. And in the on upgraded, we're going to build something that um, takes the, uh, what is it gotta be? Takes the boxed connection. So, whoops, connection. And it's synchronous, right? That's fine, it can be synchronous. It's gonna take the connection and do something with it. And one of the first things I know we're gonna need to do is split that. Um, I need this line again, right? Actually, let's grab all of these. We're gonna init we're gonna immediately split that connection and then use the same builder. Okay, so then I can't. I can't do it in that mode. Then, well, how did we do it here with the builder? Oh, we get two things back out. Okay, so then let the um, WS Builder and the response, so that's in a tuple. So it's like that, right? And this can fail if the request isn't correct, so we still need it inside of an OK. All right, so imagine that we can call start open and we get back the builder and a response, and then we're going to capture that builder in this closure here and use it to f call finish open. And we're going to take this split connection. We won't need the response here, will we? We don't have the response. We don't have the response. Yeah, we don't need the response. We don't have a trailer either. And what was that, ex that extra parameter that I had for finish open for um, client? Max frame size. Uh, do I put that there? Or do I put it here? I guess we'll put it here so that I don't need it here anymore. So really the start open just takes the request and makes a builder and a response out of it then, right? And then we'll end up saying, uh, providing the connection and the other configuration in finish open. Okay, so then um, this should always succeed. So there will not, it'll be infallible so I can just do that. And then we have to figure out what we're going to do after that. Probably I need to send it through a channel to a worker thread of some kind. Okay, but let's say that there's not an error. Then I think we still are required to return a fetch results, but here we can fill in some kind of error code, right? So we can say um, let mute response equal response new. Response dot status code is uh, what do we, we typically do? Probably take the error, which means I should probably match on this. Ah, uh, I don't know. Maybe we just keep it generic for now. If there's an error, what would I actually? You know what? If there was an error, we'd probably want the error type to contain some kind of um, values to place in status code. Okay, so then let's imagine start open is really nice to us and gives us all the information we need. So in that case, I'm going to turn this around and say match that. In the case of OK, we can say the, that is the arm. So indent that. Instead of an else there, there's a comma, and then we have an error. Um, in this case, the error object we would expect would be something we invent, like um, like bad request or something, or something more specific to a WebSocket builder. So maybe something like, mm, I'm bad with names, <laughs> like, How about just error HTTP? What do I have for that? That's unable to connect to server. So I need something. I need some. Maybe rename this to. Actually, this can. What am I looking at? This is the wrong kind of error. <laughs> this, right. I need to say that it is a um, web sockets. Whoa, how did that happen? WebSockets error or something. What kind of errors do I have there? Protocol not switched, connection not upgraded. 
Invalid handshake response. Oh, there's a bunch we could get. Um, maybe I'll I'll handle that later. I, I'm kind of lazy right now. I'll just say to do handle specific errors differently. But for now, I will just say any kind of error we get, make a new response, and we'll just put some kind of generic status code in there. We'll just blame we'll blame the uh, client. Four hundred means like a generic failure on the client side, right? HTTP cat. Uh, where was it? HTTP cat, yeah. I want HTTP cat. What was 400 again? Bad request, exactly. <laughs> Response dot uh, reason string from bad request. So we'll just give keep it generic for now. Okay, and then um, we have to give back the connection again. I'm upgraded. We're not going to allow it to be upgraded because it's a bad request. Right. Right. So then we're done, right? And then I get rid of this for now. That ends the fetch. Okay, what's wrong with reason phrase here? Oh, it's a cow. So I don't need to do string from I can just do bad request into. Into a cow. We're putting a bad request into a cow. That's clone on write, which means it starts its life as a slice, a string slice that might last to the end of the program. But if we if if it needs to own it, it will clone it. That that actually rhymed, didn't it? If it needs to own it, it will clone it. All right, then what's wrong with my box here? Probably because I am not returning a future. No method name boxed found for opaque type feature in the current scope. Okay, it. I need to pull in a use of apparently. So what did I need for that? Uh, what if we just ask Clippy to tell me? Web sockets, cargo Clippy, example, auto bond server. As you can see, like, Developing on Linux with Rust is almost exactly the same as Windows because the tools are all the same. Is this what I'm missing? Actually, I wonder if it's caused by these other errors. What if we could fix these other errors first? So I don't have them yet, so I need to invent them. Uh, arc? Okay, that's different. I just need to pull in Arc. That's standard sync arc, right? And why do I have an arc there? I don't remember why I had an arc there. I might need to revisit that. Anyway, we're taking the the factory function and uh, putting inside of an arc for some reason. I don't remember. What's wrong with my server start? Oh, we need to map the error there. There's a, okay, we need to map that to something else. HTTP. Error HTTP, right? And then I need to change this because the original one was, um, that's a client error. Now it's a server error. Unable to start the web server. There we go. I like it. Okay, so that error's, oh, no, there's more errors here. Ah. Run test needs to mutate that server. Actually, why does it even borrow it? Why not just own it? Actually, why do we even... Um, there's no reason to even construct it outside. We can just do that, and then it can be mutable. And we don't need to p borrow it, right? Okay. So down to two errors. Let's define these missing functions. So we'll be changing our builder APIs to make this work. Or maybe what I'm doing is just I'm adding an alternative way to do it. So client builder has a start and finish open. Server builder just had an open, but it can we can keep that open, right? We can just add an alternative start open that returns result. In this case, it's a um, response only, right? No, we need a 
this is an associated method, right? So it's going to return a self and a response or an error. Paste. Oh, I don't have anything to paste. Never mind. Uh, it gets a request. It's it going to own the request? I don't think it needs to, right? It just needs to borrow it. So borrow a request. Okay, and then the guts of this would be similar to the beginning part of Open Server, correct? So we're just going to copy that. Uh, back to open, start open, please. Ah, there, paste. Okay. Which makes me think, since I just did a copy paste, that open server probably should just call start open and, so yeah, I'll probably remove that and instead have it call start open and immediately call finish open. So start open is just verifying that the request has valid things in it, right? So if it's valid, we do want to make a response. And we do want to do an OK, but instead of making a WebSocket, I need to make a self here. And then the response. So how do I do this? We, um... Actually, do I have any state for self? I don't yet. So, okay. We will need that though, right? Because, because why? Why do I need that? What did the client need in terms of state? It needed a handshake key. We actually, we don't even need that. Then what am I doing here? This just verifies the start open, so we don't even need to return a self. We could just return a response and then finish open could finish open could be an associated method. There we go. So I can just do that. We can just give the response back. There we go. And then um, where we use it, we just get a response and we don't even need a builder because we just repeat the class name, the, um, I keep saying, class, that's a, in the habit of saying that is a class, it's a type in Rust. There are no classes in Rust. <laughs> Finish open. Right. How come we can't split the connection here? Oh, it doesn't know yet. Okay, so an asso another associated function, actually, why don't we just have it split the connection? Is there any reason for me to split it first and then pass it in versus split it in the finish open? It would be cleaner, right? Would anything split it earlier? Probably not. So yeah, so then um, I don't need to do that here. I can do it inside of finish open, which I don't have a place for yet. Let's add it now. Uh, that didn't work. So I need to go down to the bracket and hit enter a few times. Now I can say pub function finish open. In this case, we're given a connection that's boxed. Why did the cursor jump like that? Um, and we will always return a WebSocket, I think. Right, so split the connection. So then I can just pass connection. Oh, right, I also chose to put the um, max frame size there. So we'll move it. I mean, not move it, but copy copy that argument to here. Oh, I need a name here. There we go. Uh, what? Oh, does this thing operate with an already split connection? Is that how it works? I think so. So then we want we do want to split it earlier because yeah, this whole library works with split connections. Yeah, okay, so it's like that then. Then um, then this finish open is similar to the client. Oh, well, same thing as the open. Right, okay. Then that goes there. We don't split it. I just need to do... Um, what? The last part of what open server does? which is to do this. Okay, yeah, I can see. Yeah, it's just going to be this part. Yep. 
Uh, yes. Paste, please. There we go. And it's always okay, so we just do the WebSocket new with response doesn't matter. There we go. And I don't need to split it there. Yes. Yeah, I think I'm going to keep it even though they're, these are associated functions. And yeah, this should just call them in sequence, I think. Well, no, this could err. Oh, if it err. Oh, oh, I see how to do it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. We say um, let response equal self start open request question mark self finish open actually um yeah the connections max site that's perfect look at that then i don't need the other f uh what's wrong here oh we have to wrap this with an okay don't we uh why didn't that not work oh because it needs the response to okay so then it's a tuple with the websocket as the first thing and the response as a second thing. Perfect. So there's the one, the one step open if you can use the connection right away. We just check the request, build a response, and then bundle it with the WebSocket that uses the connection right away. But if you need it in two steps, like in our case, you just do start open, you get back the response, and then once you get the connection split, you know, back and split, then you finish. All right. What's a box? I have maybe a 75% um, sufficient understanding of it, so I'm going to leverage a little bit of the uh, book, the Rust book. So if I refer to the Rust book, and we go to where they define box, which I don't exactly remember where, but we'll find it. Because I want to lean on this when I explain it. Yes, it is what's it is one of the kinds of smart pointers in Rust. It allows you to store data on the heap rather on, than on the stack. So essentially, if you move something into a box, you are taking it. If it um, if it was on the stack, you're taking it off the stack and, and moving it to heap allocated memory. If it was already on the heap, boxing it really doesn't do much. It just, um, yeah, actually, I'm not even sure if it does anything. It probably says down here. Yeah, what the, it's essentially just a pointer. It's, it's the equivalent to in C or C++ having a pointer to something that you get by calling new. But it's a little bit more flexible because you don't have to um, call the constructor you can provide an already constructed value and just place it into the box. So that's what we're doing here with, uh, where is it? Where's here? Here. We already have uh, two values and we're going to put them in boxes. So it's, um, we don't have to make a new connection Rx and Tx using a constructor. They're already constructed and we're simply moving them to the heap and holding onto a, a pointer to them. I think that's essentially what this says, right? Yeah, because you have a pointer to the heap, you can do it with types whose sizes aren't known at compile time. Similar to like in C++ or C, when you do a malloc or a new, you um, don't need to know at compile time how big the thing you're allocating is since the allocation is runtime. Yeah, so you can, to ensure the data won't be copied, that's one of the other things the box says, is it doesn't let you copy the value once it's put into the box. You have to unbox it to, to, to copy it again. Yeah, and um, this is what I'm using it for also. You want to own a value and you care only that it's a type that implements a particular trait. Uh, I'll show you exactly why I do that in my client example, in my client code. So um, let me find it first <laughs> before I start to explain. There we go. 
So imagine that you went through all the trouble of making a TCP connection to the server, and now at this point you're like, well, we could just return that TCP stream, or we might wrap it with the TLS layer, transport layer security. So these two things, the TLS connection and the connection, are different types. TLS connection is a TLS stream uh, concrete type on TCP stream, right? A, t a connection, though, is just a TCP stream. So it's impossible to make a type that um, contains one of two different types unless you do one of two things. You either have to have a variant, which I could have picked. So connection results, this connection could have been an enum of either a TCP stream or a TLS connector of a TCP stream. Or um, the second alternative is we just say, hey, don't even be concerned about the actual type at compile time. Allow us to hold anything that implements this trait. So it, it kind of it gives us a little bit of separation. It also lets me do some really cool things, like anything that implements this trait could be in the connection results. For example, a mock connection that we might put in our test framework for testing when we don't actually want to use a real network connection. It would work too. So a mock version of connect could um, make a false connection and give it and put it into a connection results and it would be legitimate. Whereas if I chose instead to hold on to either this TCP a TLS stream or a TCP stream, I can't use a fake connection here. It has to be a real one, right? Because those are concrete types that use the network APIs of the operating system, right? So that. Um, the cost is this box has a level of indirection we've inserted now. Now instead of actually have, owning a value of type TCP stream or TLS stream, we have a pointer to something and then at runtime it um, has to dereference that pointer to get to the thing. So for the cost of in, indirection now we have the uh, ability to um, have any kind of connection so I, I use it for either the TCP or the TLS. The things that you read were kind of boxes magic and weren't really helpful. Yeah, so uh, the book, the thing is, th this is not always easy to understand on the first read. So when I, when I read this the first time, like I said, I only got like 75% understanding of box. When you reread this after you've practiced a while, you recognize, oh yeah, that, I did use a box for that, right? Where... At compile time, they should say at compile time, you only care that it's a type that influences a particular trait, right? Because then it makes more sense to me. At runtime, you always care about the type of the thing, right? That something has to care. Either you do or the, or the uh, runtime does. But at compile time, you might not, you, you don't want it to be strictly bound to a specific type. You just want it to be something that implements a trait. So, yeah, yeah but these bullet points are roughly the different reasons why you might use a box. Um, this type I've seen before also, where let's say you wanted to have pass an array to a function, but you, at compile time, you don't know the length of the array. Um, one way to do that is to put the array in a box. The box can have, basically a box is a pointer. A pointer can point to something whose length is not known at compile time, right? Another way to do that, of course, would be to use a slice, which is essentially the same thing. A slice is a pointer to something that you don't know the size of at compile time. Um, but yeah, you could use a box array of characters instead of a string slice. It's perfectly fine. Um, it's just a different way of doing it. Um, this one is a more obscure one. That I think what they're getting at his, here is that you want to give some object to another thread or function or something, but you want to make sure that it doesn't get cloned. By putting it into a box, you're saying, well, here, you just have it. Um, you don't, you, it's not required to clone it or copy it. You now own it. Hey there, Nui. That one of the trickiest, one of the tricky things when you start working with Rust is telling the difference between owned, borrowed, and borrowed, or um, exclusively borrowed. So owned means that you are in control of its lifetime, so you are allowed to move it around in memory, you um, can change it, you can do anything you want to it. Borrowed means you only are given a glance or a view into it. 
And you might not be the only one. It's not exclusive. You might have other threads looking at that same value. So you're not allowed to change it. You're not allowed to move it, all that stuff, right? Exclusively borrowed means that you are guaranteed to be the only one who's looking at it. You don't own it. So it, uh, you're not in control of its lifetime, but you are allowed to change it. So the key things to map that to Rust syntax is that's some type T. Borrowed is you have ampersand T. Exclusively borrowed is you have ampersand mute T. So getting these three concepts down and like mapping them to syntax, I think is really important. And it's not something that I grasped right away. It's, I'm still like filling in the missing details of the intuition. When you see T, you own it. So owned means can move, can mutate, in control of lifetime. So can drop, right? Borrowed means can cannot move, cannot mutate, not in control of lifetime. And then others may be watching the same thing. Right. Exclusively borrowed means you can you still cannot move it, but you can mutate. You're still not in control of the lifetime. And nobody else can watch the same thing. That's what the exclusively means. So um, that's at least my understanding of it. You guys correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> Looking into the possibility of adding chat to your overlay, but something tells you tells me you have to use stream us, rather make my own. Just talk to CM Griffin, JT. The chat thing that's in my overlay above my head is written by Chris, and he, he doesn't use Streamlabs. It, he made his own thing. So ask Chris how he made that, and he'll probably tell you some ideas on what you could start with, what to consider. It's totally doable. You don't need to use Stream Parrot or Streamlabs. Right. You transfer ownership of the pointer rather than the memory. Yes. So when you get a... Um, a reference and you you can move the reference you just can't move the underlying value so these statements are all about the underlying value you can move a reference you can give a reference to someone else you own the reference right um, so this the list expands when you talk about what you can do with the reference like you can copy a reference you can clone a reference but you can't copy or clone an exclusive reference because then you wouldn't be able to guarantee that no one else can watch the same thing. Okay, we'll allow that. Boxes are also useful if you have recursive data structures since those will become infinitely big without end direction. Yes, exactly. So they're essentially pointers. So the, the, it gets longer. So this would be um, essentially owned on the heap is a box right of t so whoops it tried it, it thought i was completing some kind of html there so you can move no no you cannot move cannot move the value but you can move the box around right you can mutate this should not say note this one is um you are or in control of lifetime can drop and technically you can hand out references to it so others might may be watching the same thing right no that's not true um, the moment you take a reference to the th to the thing, then um, the borrow checker can track it. Actually, I don't know. This is what I do know. <laughs> so you can see, like, if we were to make a matrix of what you can and can't move, um, different different checkboxes would apply to these different types. So you can't move the thing because it's now on the heap um, while it's in the box. You can take it out of the box and then move it because if you take it out of the box, it becomes owned, right? Uh, but while it's in the box, you can't move the T. You can move the box of T, though. You can mutate the T, and you are because, and mostly because you are in control of its lifetime. You can drop the box, and then it gets deallocated. Yeah, it, so it get, the list goes on and on because there's there's um, there's uh, 
pin of a of a, a pinned reference to a T, right? There are how come I can't get the formatting to work here? <laughs> it's killing me. You're killing me, editor. There's a pin mute T. Ah. There's a pin box T. So each time you introduce one of these wrappers, and you know, a, a ampersand technically is a wrapper. It's it's basically a uh, a pointer to an object rather than the object itself, right? Um, pin box, and, you, and when they start to combine, the the semantics all change. So um, I'm not even going to talk about pin because I don't I don't I don't know enough about it. <laughs> Roughly, though, what pin does is it makes a guarantee that the thing inside won't move as long as the pin exists. Don't save. All right. So, yeah, we, I'm using box primarily here because I want to be more flexible in what's inside. It could be in a normal, uh, a, a, it could be a connection without security or a connection with security. All right. That's quite helpful. Yeah, that's what we try to do here. Just use the Twitch WebSockets. Yeah, I haven't tried using the Twitch WebSockets yet. I've been using the Twitch, uh, the old school IRC-like API. Because it was simple text line interface. Uh, maybe that's what I do when I test out my WebSockets here in Rust as we ta start talking to Twitch. Then I can involve the audience. <laughs> oh, thank you for the follow. I, my understanding of the Twitch WebSockets is it's just a replacement for their old line-based IRC protocol, or IRC-like protocol. Thought you're following already. Oh, okay. Hi, Joker Dan. I also should say hi to some other people who were chatting. Saru, hello. And Just B, hello. Welcome. Okay, let me get back to this. Why can I not split this? Oh, because it's not known yet. Oh, because I have other compiler errors. Okay, we need to fix the other errors. This we can't box yet because why? Because of the other error. Is it because I haven't finished this one? I did finish that one. Why does it not know the type? It should know the type of connection because on upgraded, it's... Oh, it's option. That's the problem. Yeah. We um, need to make sure we... So if, if we don't get a connection back, we would just drop this on the floor, right? So we, we can just say if let some connection equal connection. That's probably why the split is um, was was uh, giving me trouble, right? Oh, probably also because of this to-do being here. Uh, this is still a problem. Why? Oh, I need to box this whole thing. Uh, box new this. Uh-oh. Oh, I had the option in the wrong spot. It's the callback itself. All right, so um, this is sum. So there's no option in the inside. I was wrong about that. Okay, that's good. Now about this outer box. What am I doing wrong there? No method name box. Oh, because I need to pull in... Okay. I always forget what implements boxed. I'm surprised that it... I didn't order that I already have that imported, but... It's either standard that has boxed or it's future. Is it future that has boxed? Ah. Yeah, we want to wrap a future in a box pinning it, so that's future EXT. Futures future EXT. There we go. Oh, but now we have a bigger problem. What is this? Uh, okay, so what's bo it's borrowing request. So we wanted to own the request. Move. Okay, now we're back to no compiler errors, but we have some warnings. Yeah, so this is correct. We're not using the WebSocket yet, because that's to do. So let's just hide its name for now. I'm never using serve WebSocket 
because why? Oh, because I wanted to take this WebSocket and give it to something that's going to call webs. So we haven't written that yet. And we don't need these errors yet, so I can delete them. Deleting the errors. All right. And we're not using URIs, correct? We're not using them? Okay, so now we're just down to, we have a WebSocket. We need to give to something that's going to serve it. So yeah, I think I need a, I think I need a, 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 some kind of context or task or something. So I'm just gonna be lazy and make a worker thread to do it. I think we'll do it inside of run tests here. We'll say um let, well I need a channel too, because we need to pass can, web sockets to to the thing. So that's under um. Is it futures? MPSC? Uh, I, I always forget this. Who? Where is MPSC? Channel. Okay. MPSC. Got it. Okay. So then um, we can make one right here. I can never remember the order of it, so I'm just going to let the compiler tell me. I want an unbounded. What does unbounded return? Gives me a sender, then receiver. Got it. Okay, so sender, re sender, sender, <laughs> receiver. Okay, and then yeah, it does. It's going to complain that it doesn't know the type yet. That's fine. You can you can just chill. Um, rather than coming up with this on my own for how to do the thread stuff, I'm just going to steal the uh, steal it from. Uh, well, did Jeeves have a worker thread? I don't remember. No. What had a worker thread? I guess my server did. So lib thread. Yes. So we're going to want thread from standard. So might as well include that now. Thread. Okay. And then how do we make a thread? Uh, that was thread spawn, right? Yeah, here we go. So I'm going to want to do this. So there, right? Down here. So spawn a thread, and we're going to hold on to the handle, right? Worker handle. And um, we'll just, we'll have a worker function. Where are we going to put that? How about right here? Feels like it should go here. All right. And then I know it's going to want be given the receiver which is an mpsc unbounded receiver of web sockets right and then um, we'll need to borrow the sender in handle test factory so let's do that uh not at this point right how do we do this in the closure that i register How do I give the thing access to this? Okay, uh, hold on. The sender we need to give to someone. Yeah, I want to give the sender to run test. Run test has the sender. So sender, I don't need this open. MPS, what am I doing? Single colon, MPSC unbounded sender of web sockets. Okay, and then, um, yeah, I think I think we have to have a closure here. And then um pass in basically we want to capture the sender by reference. So let sender be a uh, reference to a sender. And then that way, um, this can be um, basically borrowed again. Oh, wait, we get request. Okay. My phone is beeping at me. Um, I, this closure needs more. It's, what was it again? Request connection. Request connection. 
request connection sender. And then that means I can let it borrow the sender. Borrow, please. All right. Does not live long enough. Where is it dropped? Dropped here. Oh, because of the name? Or because I didn't do a move he here? Actually, what if I just say at that and remove that? Then this is a problem why it does not live long enough. It's dropped here while still borrowed. Ooh, how do we have it live long enough? I need to do a move here. There we go. Yes, there. Uh, why is it not indenting for me? There's another error, that's why. Okay, so um, semicolon. There we go. <laughs> Once you get your compiler errors done, then the formatter starts working again. So now we um, have a sender that we give to the run test. Run test takes that sender and it moves it into this closure here so that every time a request comes in, we, we can get a, another borrow of the sender. And um, then with that sender here, I can send I can send the WebSocket through it. Sender dot unbounded send of the WebSocket. And then we don't care if it doesn't make it anywhere, right? So just do that. And I need to return something, right? Oh, no semicolon. And this has to be um oh oh I did this wrong. This is On upgrade, what does it return? It doesn't return anything, so why is this not correct? What am I writing, by the way? Are you spawning a thread instead of a test because you're trying to be runtime and access? Yeah, partially, but also because I'm I I'm not familiar with the Rust, the various Rust runtimes like standard a, uh, async standard or Tokyo yet, so. I'm just being lazy. I already, I know how to spawn a thread, and that thread is just going to block on a bunch of futures that it ma maintains that it's going to get from this receiver. Um, as far as what I'm writing, just for anybody who is joining and didn't see the beginning, I'm working on a WebSockets library in Rust, and I'm setting up a echo server so that the test suite can connect to it and test it. So this whole thing is basically setting up a web server that um, opens WebSockets whenever, whenever you talk to it. Okay, so... Um, yeah, what's wrong with this? Expected lifetime for sender. Oh! Add explicit license static to the type of sender. Hold on, what? <laughs> I didn't understand that. Oh, I have to say that the reference lives till the end. Okay, yeah, we could, I guess... Do I... Can I do that? I might... Hmm. Hey there, Epic Unknown. You approve the usage of Autobahn? <laughs> but hey, for all I know, the Autobahn test suite, which again is right here. As far as I know, maybe the developers are German. It's possible. Um, okay, so it's complaining, I think, because it doesn't know the lifetime of this reference. I think it's safe to make it static because we're putting inside of an arc. But let's see if I can... Uh, this is where I'm stretching my knowledge of Rust. I don't know if I can do this. Actually, that's not how you do it, right? That's how you do it with trait bounds. I need to do, like, static here. That's what I was afraid of. <laughs> Must be valid for the static lifetime. So... It basically doesn't know that the server is going to... What if I drop the server explicitly?
Um, okay. Oh, I have to say okay. <laughs> Interesting. Is it because it, yeah, this thing could do anything with it, inc including it could live longer than the server itself? Actually, it will. Because I forgot to join the thread at the end here, didn't I? Uh, yeah, I want to do that. Actually, I want to... Hmm, I need to do that before I return errors, don't I? Yeah, so I want to let um, server result is that. And then at the end here, do server result. Correct? And then in between, I need to join the thread. So uh, how do we do that? We need to close the sender end. We need to say sender dot um, close, right? Close or close channel? I never remember which one to do. Let's do close. And close is a future, I th think. That's probably why there's a close channel too. Uh, let me look. Yeah. MPSC, unbounded sender, right, closed channel is the, yeah, is what we want. So basically closing the channel should have the worker thread bail, right, so then it should be safe to say, uh, where did I put the thread? Oh, I put the thread somewhere else. I put it in the wrong side. Um, I might, I'll have to do something with that borrow in a second. Yeah, but I need to do, after this runs, we need to say uh, worker handle dot join. Yeah. Actually, hmm, I might want to combine these two. Okay, now I need to figure out how to give it something that doesn't have a lifetime issue. I mean, we could just put it inside of an arc, I guess. I don't, it doesn't need to be inside of an arc. Can I just box it? Why don't I just box it? Let's box the sender. Let sender equal box new sender. Oops. There. And then we can um, just ca uh, clone the box, right? Actually, if we're doing that, it should be an arc, shouldn't it? Arc new. And why? Okay, because this doesn't take an arc. Now it takes an arc. And what's wrong now? Uh, that's the problem. I moved sender. Where did I do that? Oh, I moved it into... I moved it in there. So, hmm. Let's name it something else. Let's let... Sender... Sender for factory is sender.clone because then I don't need to clone it here, right? Actually, I might still need to clone it there. Yeah, I still need to clone it there, but it can use its copy. Yeah, so one of them ends up being owned by this closure al always. Every time Handle Factory is called, it gets another clone, and then we hold on to the original in order to close it. I think that all works out, right? Except for here, why? Oh, because we need to clone that again, don't we? Why do I need to clone it here? I'm moving the sender in. I don't know. <laughs> don't think I need an arc there? Probably not, but let me just get it to work and then we can figure out uh, what, I'm, what I can... I'll strip away the um, smart pointers to, until um, as I can to get it to where it works, where it still works. I want to get it to work right now, though. Sender doesn't live long enough. Bar value doesn't live enough. Sender's it's dropped on line one twenty. Is it because this future can be re-entered?
I don't quite get this. I need a little graph that Clippy gives me. It's captured here. Oh, by putting in... Do I, I don't need that box anymore, I guess, right? Or No, I still need the box. The APA requires the box. But boxing it means it could be called more than once. Oh, right. Yeah, I made, I made this thing of type... Um, F, no, I made it FN once. It's FN once, we're only going to call it once, right? So then why does it think I'm using something that's dropped? Let me read chat. Maybe Saru has told me what I need to do. Spine text is usually just async library test spawn. Yeah, I'm just doing threads instead. So I'm I'm async library generic. Just need to pass the sender by value. The could be cover compiler can't infer a lifetime for that reference on the sender, right? You can just clone the sender, pass it by value. You don't need an arc there. I can clone oh, sender is clonable directly? Okay. Then that would that should fix things, right? If I just always thing is i don't i don't think i need to do a clone here but i'm doing something weird with um, closures that requires me to clone it so you're saying i don't need to put it into an arc okay so it has nothing to do with the clone it has to do something about what i'm doing here right the fact that I boxed up a future. Is it with the, is it because of this move? Oops. Let me delete all that. Okay, it has to move its arguments, otherwise it borrows everything. Why isn't it also borrowing the sender? That's what I don't get. Is it because do I have an inner Oh, it's because of this inner closure. Right, so what if I um clone it out here? Uh, is it just catching up? Oh, it needs to be inside the arm. Uh, so I need, uh, whoops, that. No? <laughs> I thought I had it there. Okay, that, I was wrong about that. Totally wrong. Yeah, that makes sense that it's multi-producer, so it should be copy and clonable and all that good stuff. Then um, what am I not understanding about this? Oh, unsended, unbounded sender borrows. I forgot about that. Um, where am I? Unsended, unbounded send borrows self. Right? So knowing that it borrows self, it captured, wait, why is it saying it's captured there? Oh, do I need to do a move into that? There? That worked. <laughs> Make on response a move closure. Yeah, so you, you had the answer all along, Saru. Let me give you some points. Let me give you five points. Hey, good day, Dr. Mario Q. How are you doing today? Stop using glorious windows and giving NSA your info. <laughs> Just today because the Docker image that runs the Autobahn server is on Linux. And to make a fair comparison, I'm just removing the network uncertainty. So everything is going to connect on localhost on, on the Linux box. So, but um, my experience is proving what I like to say um, all along about OS. Um, I like cross-platform software. So I have a Linux Mint set up as well as a MacBook and Windows. That's one of the reasons I use VS Code, right? Use VS Code because I can run it on all three major OSs without a hitch. Yeah, I like to have that flexibility. I hate being like stuck on one OS and then I'll suddenly I'm on Linux and I'm like, I, I don't have my Visual Studio. How do I write code? 
Okay, so if I understand what I did correctly, move says we're not just borrowing sender, we're moving it in there. And I had to do that because of box, I believe. If it wasn't for the box, then the fact that this is declared to be an FN once should have been good enough because I, I can borrow it once, right? Or maybe it has something to do with it being FN once. I think... Yeah, yeah. There's still a little, like, maybe 10%, 5% amount of knowledge about how um, closures work in boxes where I don't quite understand what they're telling me, but I think I will get it eventually. They're saying it's dropped there. What does that mean, actually, in my case? What does being dropped there mean? Let's put it back to an error. Actually, I don't need to put it back to an error. Do I? I'm in the wrong file. Yeah, they're saying it gets dropped there. Why would it be dropped exactly there? That's what I kind of don't understand. I see how it's borrowed. It's borrowed right there to call that function. Which means unless we do move, that means sender itself was borrowed at the moment that we captured it. So I understand what they mean that it's captured there. I understand that. The box says the cast requires that the sender is borrowed for static. Okay, so it's because of the box trait requiring it then. That's what it is. So I just need to remember, box requires that the, um, the thing you put in has to be borrowed for an unknown amount of time. It could be forever. But then why is the sender dropped at the end there? I guess that's why I, what I don't get. Does it have to do with that move? Okay, yeah, I, I understand everything down to here. I don't know, understand why sender is dropped right on line 120. So you had to move because you return the struct it's in, so you can't have a reference to a local variable in it. Yeah, I, I understand that part. The thing is, if I don't move here, this sender is, it should be borrowed from the, um, this asynchronous closure, which, which moved it in, right? It owns all three of these, including that sender. So if this overall closure owns it, why does it say it gets dropped at the end? Oh, it gets dropped at the end because it owned it. <laughs> I get it now. Okay, let me try to explain it, see if I understand it. Because we said move here, Everything that we capture, including all three of these parameters, because they're used inside, they are now owned by this, uh, they're owned by this um, closure. That's what this is. It's an asynchronous, um, the async in front of a block means it becomes a closure, right? So everything you own gets dropped when you reach the end. So that means it's going to drop sender there. But if it allowed sender to be borrowed by a boxed closure that we handed someone else out. In fact, we return this out. It extends beyond the lifetime of this overall asynchronous closure, right? Because we only borrowed it before when I did that, we borrowed something that we owned only until we were done. So this move, what it does is it causes the sender uh, to be cloned and given out to, to the unupgraded callback. The fetch results now owns it which lives longer than... Okay, I get it now. Yeah, yeah. W if you throw a future into the mix, it's impossible for me to explain it. I just think of it in terms of when you move something into a closure, whether it's an async block or it's a traditional Lambda expression, when you do this move keyword, the things you capture get owned, which means they get dropped at the end. And if this closure... If box says whatever you um, put in the box has to live forever, potentially, and we know that the box borrowed the sender that we only own up till that point, then everything makes sense to me. Let me try to put it into layman's terms. Handle test factory is going to return some task that... When it's done, it's going to drop the request, it's going to drop the connection, it's going to drop the sender, okay? It finishes the moment it returns a fetch results. But the fetch results holds on to a boxed 
you know, some code to run later. It's a callback. So this callback is going to live longer than the factory call. So it need, it can't borrow anything from the factory. It has to, it has to have everything owned or, um, its own copy of everything independent of the factory. So I hope that makes sense. It makes sense to me now. All right. Ask me if this about a month ago, I would have been so frustrated. I probably would have ended the stream and not figured it out. Okay. So now we can, we've safely given a sender to this closure so that it can send the WebSocket to the worker thread. Worker thread doesn't actually do anything with the things it receives yet. That's not going to be the hard part. Uh, does join, join can have an error. So, um, it shouldn't though. Should we can expect, uh, the worker thread ended. Well, the worker thread, we couldn't, the worker thread could not be joined. That shouldn't happen. Um, so instead of doing an, an alternative here, some people do is unwrap, which basically says panic if it is a failure. But in this case, the only way it would fail is if, um, oh, actually this join should say when it fails. If the child thread panics. So we can actually be more specific and say the, th the worker thread panicked. It panicked is with a K, right? If you do ED, right? Or is that a British spelling? Panic, it looks better with a K to me. So I'm going to go with that. Not sure which one you're using, though, so you might want to read the docs. Not sure if the way to close the sender will work correctly. Most MPSC channels I know will only close once all the senders are closed. Oh, um... We'll have to check that. Uh, let's look at the docs. It prevents any new messages from the sender side. That's all the documents are telling me now. Disconnect would close it if there are no more senders left. Maybe that's the difference. If we want to disconnect our sender from the channel, we call disconnect, but that implies closed channels stronger, right? Because otherwise they would have they would have mentioned other senders. I'm going to go with closed channel, probably close it for everyone, but we'll find out. If it doesn't close it for everyone, then this would not cause the, th the worker to stop, and then we would expect to hang right here. Hang forever. So if our tests hang or not, uh, will tell us if we can do that. Seems like it does what I want. Yeah, I hope so. So now the hard part. So this receiver is going to get futures, essentially, right? And um, it's got to drive them all to completion. Each one's a different WebSocket. So at some point, I'm going to want to... Um, do a uh, futures select all. Is it under... Future... What, under, what is that under? Select all. Futures future... All right. Select all. All right, select all. Because we're going to have a bunch of features, right? Uh, select. Actually, um, if I just do future, there's nothing else named future, lowercase, right? So down here I can say future select all. Okay, so the if I remember right, it gives us two things, right? It'll give us the item resolved along with the index of the feature that was ready and the list of remaining features. So we actually get three things back. Uh, how do I see that? Right there, the type of the output is tuple with the future and then the index and then the remaining list of futures. So fundamentally we'll have the um, fu uh, futures and we'll have some kind of loop. Let uh, what is this resolved by? It has no resolution so it'll be unit comma we don't care comma 
futures remaining. Select all futures, right? Mm, did I not do that right? Oh, I need to drive it. Okay. So, um... I remember doing something like this. I need to add to that a future which has is handling the um the uh uh channel. And I um it's it not it might not be the best, but I did do this in my server, right? Oh, I broke it up into these kinds of tasks. Where did I like could I do it the same way, I guess? Right, here's the one that had the, um, oh, why did I have to put it into an arc mutex? I don't know. But ultimately, this has a uh, select all here. Ah, uh, right. We had it return something to, to, to let us know if we needed to add a new feature to handle the channel. Yeah, this was the this was what I ended up with. Why does why does it need to be an arc mutex though? Let's see if I can get away without doing that. So I need a flag similar here. So let um yeah needs this is mutable needs um receiver future true if needs receiver future then um, we end up making one and boxing it and pushing it in. Why? I keep asking myself, why do I have a mutex around the processors? I don't even remember why. I probably don't even need that. I'll try to, yeah, again, I'll try to do it without it. Yeah, but I want to do the same kind of thing. We want to take the receiver and do a take, expect, and then, um, call something asynchronous box that future up yeah so yeah right let um handle receiver oh uh this should be um what are, my names are horrible next connection all right because this handle each time you take one it's a new connection so this would be like next WebSocket, right? Oh, I put that in the wrong place. <laughs> uh, why did I... Why, what, what am I doing? Next WebSocket equals handle receiver. Yeah, it's got to take the receiver, take... Uh, the different kind of take. Is this a different kind of type? It's an unbounded receiver. I wonder if that comes from a different... Um, oh, the take is because it was in a was in an option. Why did I put it into an option? Oh, right, we have to because the future owns it temporarily. Right, so that... Yeah, the receiver needs to be put into an option because it's, we move it into a future and then we get it back out at the end. So, um... Let receiver equal sum receiver. And then we have to take it out, and then... Uh, how do we to get the next one? Oh, I need to expect, yes. Expect... Uh, we dropped the receiver. That shouldn't happen, right? But provided we don't drop it... Oh, I'm providing it to that function. I think... Why did I need the processors there? Oh, because it ends up making the futures and pushing into it. I get it. And... Ah, this is a funny way of doing it. Um,
Yeah, I don't need to do any of this stuff, right? So it's just that. And let's say it returns none if 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 we're supposed to exit. So then um, I would say if next WebSocket is none, break. Otherwise, um, whoa. Uh, better to say match, right? None break some WebSocket. All right. So actually, I need a I need something there because we need to know which feature it is. So in fact, this feature needs to return a special variant. Yeah. So um, I need something here like um, future kind. Or work kind or something like that. Work kind. Let's invent it here. Enum work kind is either a web socket or a receiver. Okay, and then um, let's just define this now. Async handle receiver is going to take the uh, receiver which is going to own temporarily so we need, we're going to need to get it back from here we're going to get it back here and oh and along with that we'll get back a uh, web socket so hold on I need to do an await here, and I need to do... I need to do a match, don't I? No, no, I'm thinking about this wrong. That is the future, we're gonna wait for it later. Yeah. Uh, if it is the rec if it, it'll be that kind for this future. Yeah, so we get a receiver and we get a WebSocket. Okay, so then... Um, Yeah, I'll handle it here. I think it's cleaner this way. So then um, it just needs a receiver. And it's going to return a work kind. The work kind is going to be receiver. Receiver and WebSocket. Oh, no, that needs to be option. I said that earlier, right? Uh, so this is sum. If actually, this is going to depend on what we get for receiver next uh, function would be necessary there. Hey, good night, Nui. Thanks for being here. Hope I'm not. Um, hope this is still interesting, even though it's not C plus plus anymore. Is it next? I forget how to. Get the next thing from receiver. That'll be in here, right? Yeah, it's next. And then await. So match receiver next await. If it is a um, some web uh, some web socket then we're doing this right if it's none then actually this then this whole thing can be wrapped like this right um wait can't do that because um the order of things right i needed to do it this way Maybe I should do a map. Actually, with a map, it would... Yeah, I'll have trouble with this own value. I misspelled receiver. I misspelled receiver several times. Wow, I'm bad. Uh, 
Uh, we don't have a WebSocket. Actually, no, we do have a WebSocket. So that's um, WebSocket is some, a WebSocket's none. Uh, it's mutable, yes. Okay, so that works. And I'm pretty sure I can't do... I can't remove the, um... The redundancy by doing this, but let me see. The trick would be if, if I could use ref, use that first. But let, let's see if I can. Because then, um... I can just say, I don't have to do a match. I can just wait. I can do exactly that. Yeah, see, it's giving me a, it's going to give me a problem saying I borrowed it after I moved it. Yeah, so I can't do that. I have to, I have to do that, which is roughly the same thing, right? We're always returning a work kind receiver with the receiver, but it's either we got a WebSocket or we didn't. Actually, can I fold these together? Can I do let... I can do that, right? I can say let WebSocket equal that. That's how we're, that's how we're going to do it. Because I, I just noticed that the, the pattern matches the same thing we, we, we return there. So we can just do this. And that. Perfect. So we first wait for the next thing to come out of the receiver pipe. If it's something, it's something. If it's nothing, it's nothing. But, but we return it out of the future. Uh, that's that's neat. Do I even need that to be a separate function? I can almost do a async block there. All right. Uh, we need to await. Oh, what am I doing? Oh, for some reason, I thought I was supposed to handle it there. I don't handle that there. We're going to get a future back, and I'm going to want to push it. So um, this would be futures push next websock. Get future, right? Okay, and then um, this needs to do... Well, what's wrong with this? Uh, what? I can't even read that. <laughs> Show it to me graphically. Oh, I need to un I need to mark something as unpin. Obviously. Oh, is it because I didn't didn't fuse it? I don't know what I'm doing wrong there. I don't think I fused it here. What did I do here? For us, uh, the the select all. Did the await, that is, wait, what the heck am I doing with take? Ooh, what was I doing there? Oh, does the API of select all require it to be pinned? It has to be future plus unpin for the item. Oh, right, we need to give it an iterator of unpinned futures. Is that why I'm doing this weird take thing? Vector of pinned boxed. I think that's what it is. Arc is that why it was in an arc mutex? I don't understand this. What was I doing here? It has to be future and unpinned. So actually that unpin we get from boxing, right? Did I forget to box? I forgot to box it. That's the problem. Um, okay, it still didn't work. Vector of boxed futures. Wait, it's still not unpin? I thought putting it in a... Okay. 
I have to box and pin the future? Okay, well, I can do that. Uh, that's pin box, right? And we get pin from... Um, pin? I guess I'm wrong. Or is it box pin? Maybe that was it. All right, so this just needs to be mutable now, and I think I'm good. Ah, uh, what? Oh, because I moved it in here, I need to move it back. So, um, yeah, that's let futures equal futures remaining. I can't do that? Maybe that's why this also was boxed. Or, um, because it's in a loop, right? And it was pulled in here. I guess we'll just, um... I hate to do this, but sum. And then this is take. And this is um, futures replace. Really? Oh, shoot. Um, how about instead we do a... We let it borrow it, so we do a ref cell new. So this would be a borrow mute. This is not mutable anymore, and this is also borrow mute. Is it gonna get me? Let me get away with that. No. <laughs> it wants to actually take it, right? So I actually, yeah, okay. See ya, JT. Problem is, I don't remember writing that. I don't know what I was doing here. But maybe that's what... Maybe I just need to get used to what take does. This becomes a copy that took all the, took the memory of it. I see that. So then, um, going let's go back and to what it was in the beginning. So let futures in equal standard mem take futures, and then I had to do some weird thing where I had to get a mutable reference. Oh, that's only because I locked it, right? just needs to take mutable reference and then that takes the features in and then we get features remaining okay so then um what's wrong with receiver here not declared as mutable okay good <laughs> so this makes sure that the whatever features we didn't complete yet get put back in and then we possibly add a receiver future and we're going to add that whenever um this work kind is a certain thing so i need to do a match on work kind if it's a work kind receiver we're going to get back the receiver and um out and the web socket right so we'll want to make a future for the WebSocket and put it in, but for now, um, not going to do anything with it. The WebSocket kind, we don't need to do anything with. It just naturally get... Um, it means it, we completed a WebSocket. We can just drop it. So do nothing. Uh, what's wrong with this? Was What is type is this again? It's a work kind. Oh, shoot. I always forget that. 
I actually need to name it there. Okay, so given that, if we get the receiver back, then needs receiver future is true. And I forgot to set it false here. If we put it into the futures vector, we don't need to put another one unless it completes down here. Okay, if it completes, then then we have the receiver back. So receiver dot replace receiver out. Okay, so this will guarantee we make new futures um, to um, handle these web sockets. I need to do that here, right? So I need to do uh, let um, next. Well, ha let ws. Well, let let um, ws future equal handle web socket. Web socket. Futures dot push box pin. Actually, do I still need to pin that? I think I do. Box pin uh, web socket future. And that's it. So then handle WS up here. Let's do the right thing with features. No, it won't. I need to take futures remaining and push it in there. Which means this needs to be mutable. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so then handle WebSocket. I need that async function or did I already make it up here for serve websocket I did okay we already have a we already have the feature up there serve websocket and is the type not right wait why why is there an option in there oh right because it if, if it's none we want to break out yes okay so if let some websocket equal websocket do all this stuff right else break uh oh the outputs don't match oh the outputs don't match yeah 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 yeah. okay so this work kind i need it up here because this needs to return it but it's always just going to return work kind websocket All right. Still doesn't like it. Why not? Uh, that's too hard to read. Expected opaque type found a different opaque type. Okay, it's between the lines 98 and 47. So what's on line 48 and 97? Four, uh, 98. Work kind. And what's on 47? Work kind. What? Uh, I don't get it. Oh, shoot. Is the type of features remaining... Okay, the type of... The, it all comes back to this, right? Vector of pin boxes to an implementation of future. So what was, what was, how did it resolve it here? Vector of pin box. Oh, there was a send in there, but that's the only difference. Oh, that's dine future. This is impl future. So, how did I make get this one to be dine future? Box dine future. Maybe it's in the signature of these. No, it just returns the kind. Okay, I don't get it then. Oh, is it because of that? Did I forget to box these? I did forget to box them. Box that one, and then box the other one. We can't box that one. Why can't we box that one? Oh, because it's not... 
Sync is not implemented for ref cell split sync. What? Oh, this WebSocket is not sync. It's not send, I mean. Or sync. That would be a problem if we can't send a WebSocket across threads. Whoa. <laughs> Wow, that's crazy. I think ultimately it comes down to what's about to... It's this WebSocket, right? How come it said... Okay, I don't know why it said that. One of these is not sendable. That's an enum. What about this one? That's an unbound receiver. Another unbounded receiver. Okay, should I do Musen's trick to see if something is send or not? You did have this thing where you do a... Well, why come up with it from memory when I have it in my notebook? Musen came up with a nifty way to tell if something was... Um, implements a trait. Looking for it. Here it is. Ah, uh, I can just hit Control V. Right, assert send t send assert send put type here. So we're gonna put web socket there. Interesting. So it is sendable. Is it that? Is it sync that we can't do? No, it's send and sync. So that's not it then. WebSocket can be sent. This is, it's something else about that feature, I guess. What awaits do we have in here? We have an await on a sync. Oh. Well, that's a bummer. Can I, I can't box, I can't box that feature. What am I going to do? And this is a horrible guide to what, what's what's broken. <sighs> There's a a ref mute somewhere inside of that future, and the type is just enormously complicated because it's a generated future from an async block. How am I going to figure this one out? I guess I can't. So that means I can't box it. Well, how the heck am I going to handle this then? The other place I was boxing it, right? Boxing it there and then... Um, inside here we also boxed features, right? Yeah, right here. Maybe I need to be explicit and make it a dying future. I bet you that's what I need to do. I need to say that it, the future is um, a dynamic type. Okay, um, that's the difference. I did, I did have this be type aliased, and I didn't do it here. So let me try that. That would be here, right? I would have to say um, a vector of... What is it now? It's a vector of pin... Pin box, pin box? How did that happen? Did I box it twice by accident? Oh, I did. Look at that. Okay, yeah. I'd, so the boxing wasn't the problem. It actually gets pinned and boxed there. So the same thing can be said, yeah, down here. Okay, that's that was a mistake. Right, so it's a vector of pin boxed futures, but I want to be explicit and say it's dying instead. So dine. And I can't say that because this is in a namespace, right? Ah, 
yes. Oh, that did it. All right, cool. So we figured it out. All right, I don't want to do let. I want to do, say, futures. Um, Just futures equal, right? Yeah. Hey, there we go. We got it to work. <laughs> so that's interesting. By default, it did impl instead of dying, and it had trouble with the um, with pinning these um, features. Weird. Okay. Well, does it do everything I need it to do? Let me review this. So, what the worker thread is going to do? It's going to make a vector of futures that each future is handling a WebSocket, or it's the one that's handling the channel. The special one that we always add. So, r by default, we need it. And um, what that future does is it takes the receiver and waits for the next message on it. And then it may or may not be a WebSocket. If it's a WebSocket, that means we got a connection. If it's not, that means we were told to um, we the channel was closed. So um, we take that future and we, we pin it and box it and put it into our list and say we don't need to make another one. Then we take those futures off so that we can pass ownership to future select all and then it runs all the futures concurrently and it tells us which one which we don't care which one finished and we get the output of that future and i'm using this enum work kind to tell me if it's the um the handle receiver future will always return receiver so that we can get the receiver out along with the web socket right if it's a web socket handler that that one, um, when it completes, just tells us that it was a WebSocket future. So um, based on what we get back, if it's a WebSocket future, we say, okay, hasta la vista, WebSocket, you're disconnected, but we're going to continue our life. If it's a receiver future, that means we got a new connection, or we were told to um, stop. If we're told to stop, we break out of our loop. If we got a new connection, then um, we're going to want a loop. So um, since the receiver future just finished, we need to mark that we need a new one. We need to store the receiver back so that we can package it back up and give it to the next future. And we generate the future that handles the new WebSocket and push it into our list. And then every loop, we make sure that the features we get back out that are not finished, we, we put back in for the next loop. I think this will work. Should I give it a shot? I'm scared. <laughs> So to run it, it would be cargo run example auto bon server. All right, here goes nothing. Oh, interesting. It exited right away. What does that tell me? And these print messages are coming from the HTTP server, I think. I left that go I left those in there. Somehow it was told to exit. Wait. What's this? Oh right, right, right. Um so yeah, it never got a it, it it exited early somehow. So that means the channel closed early? Oh, we never ran this to completion. This will be a future, right? Oh, no, it's not. What does start do again? Oh, start. Start starts the worker thread, right? Oh, no, it sends it to the worker. Right, so we need to actually wait here until what point? Until someone hits control C? I think, yeah, we need to, this needs to run forever. Actually, yeah, here's where we would do it, like, wait until he hits Control-C, I think. Yeah, so then um, let me introduce that Control-C handler. I have it in Jeeves, don't I? Jeeves, where are you? Jeeves, you have a Control-C handler, right? Yes, you do. So I did it with this kind of a thing. I have a, a select on whichever happens first that... Um, Actually, um, I don't even need to select. I can just do, I can just await on Control-C, new. 
unwrap, I think. Yeah, we can do that here. We can say, um, control C new unwrap await. And we just need to pull in control C from async control C, which I need to put into the dependency list because it's probably not there. Okay, so given that this is an example, then we can put it under dev dependencies. So that's, uh, let's look at what it was for Jeeves. Control C version 1.2. Sounds good to me. All right, so do your calculations. Uh, what's wrong with this import? Unresolved. What do you mean unresolved? I think, yeah, it builds, so I think there's just something wrong with the re with the um, analyzer again. I'm just told to reload. Ah, uh, that didn't fix it. Let's just reload the whole thing. Reload the whole thing, I said. <laughs> reload. Window. I don't know why it didn't, res it, it couldn't resolve that for some reason. Now it is. Alright, whatever the problem, let's run it again. Uh, web sockets might as well run from there, right? So cargo run example auto bond server. Okay, sitting there waiting for connections. Now, if I hit Control C, wait a minute, it bailed out. Oh, did we not print? Oh no, it printed he exiting. Okay. Do I want to like annotate the server here with prints? Might as well, right? Let's do that. Let's have um, here print line now serving. Uh, why, don't, why don't we just, this would be fun. Why don't we have a counter and put it in here? So we would have um, let mute ws count equals zero, and then we would increment it here. Um, socket count plus equal one. Print line now serving web socket number ws count. All right. So every time we get a connection, we should see that. Um, but in, I'm just going to be pessimistic and think and, and consider if that it's, we get a bug and we never reach that line. Where are some print statements we can do earlier than that? Probably up here. We can say print. Actually, I can do it in here. Print line. Waiting for the next, um, waiting for the next connection, really. Okay. And actually down here where we resolve it, we can we should print hand down here, print line. Uh where we're gonna say receiver ended or something, um receiver closed. Um all done. All done serving web sockets. Okay, thanks, bye. All right, now when I run it and hit Control C, it should at least say that message. Yep, all done serving web sockets. Okay, thanks. Bye. Okay, so that tells me that this select all here works for at least resolving the um, receiver future, and um, and the close of the channel works because that's how we got a none out, which got us here. So. If everything works right, I can run it and then start the auto bond test. There goes nothing. Run the auto bond. Pseudo client. Yep. Address already in use. Oh, I need to do a uh, server. No, a client, right? Wait. No, I need to do... Why is it saying listen to 9002? 
Am I running the right one? Error starting user land proxy listen to 9002 bind already address already in use. Oh, I don't want to... Shoot, that's a mistake in the script. I don't actually want to bind that socket at all, right? That is not a server socket inside Docker. That's um, outside, so... I don't want that dash P at all. All right, try again. Connection refused. Um, but we are connected. Sad face. Am I? Yeah, we're listening for connections. Okay, how does that mean I have to connect Docker outgoing connections somehow? Oh, wait, this is the wrong address, right? I need to figure out what the address is to connect to from Docker outside. Uh, what did uh, auto? What, what did Tungstenite do? They use the local host. How did, did how did they run this then? Oh no, that's um. No, they are binding to local host only. How does that work then? How does their configuration look? Buzzing client. Yeah, they're connecting to look. That should that will only work if they ran everything inside of the same Docker image, right? Maybe they didn't run it with Docker. I guess they didn't, right? So how do I know what IP address to use to get out of? Or I guess how do you tell Docker that outgoing connections to a certain port should go to the same machine? Um, do I need to research Docker? <laughs> Docker, uh, map port. Uh, it jumped or something. Why did it jump? Why did it jump to the end? Okay, I don't know. Let's read about it. This is in the image. Do I have to do it in the image? What, uh, I don't have my own image. Oh. A lot of crud there. Oh, here. Ah, uh, I see. I remember seeing these IP addresses, actually. Let me see if I can see it here, but I don't want to show it on screen, so I'm going to drag it off for a second. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. What's the gateway, then? So I can try this gateway address, maybe. So clear that. Uh, VI. Oh, no, I don't want to be. Uh, do I have it open here? Open editors. Do I have it here? I do. Oh, no, I don't. I guess I can just open the file, right? Autobahn config buzzing client. Okay, so I can try what they uh, what the standard Docker gateway address is one seventy. Why do they use one seventy two? That's weird. Seventeen zero one. Okay, we'll try that. All right, here we go. Hey, that worked. Look, it's accepting connections. Reset by peer. It did something. OS error 104, though. Unable to see, receive request from client. Why would it say OS error 104? Uh, 
That's odd. Well, it it should have generated a report, right? So Firefox reports servers. Or is it clients? I can't remember. I get these confused so easily. It's servers. Index HTML. Yeah, we got failures across the board. 404 not found. Oops. <laughs> okay, then. Um, we're returning something. We're returning 404 not found. Um, oh, it's that's it, actually getting that slash. Okay. Then I think I know what I need to do. So it is... I don't know why we're getting... Uh, Oh, no, this is normal. That means they dropped their connection. Okay, then then we're on the right track then. So that we're, it's actually talking to us from the inside of the Docker instance. I just need to um, tell it to serve the correct path. So I had left the path out because I didn't think I needed a path there, but I guess I do. So I need an empty path. I need an empty path segment in there. Uh, what's wrong with that? Uh, oops. Smack in the box. Six months in a row with Twitch Prime? I'm honored, Smack in the box. How are you today? I'm doing really obscure things with Rust and WebSockets and tests and stuff. Uh, where am I looking? I'm looking at Jeeves. What, how did I do this with Jeeves? Jeeves, how did I register resources with you? Oh, I wanted them to go into a vector. Vector. There we go. You're good, busy as heck, but good, I'm glad. Here, you're about to see that potentially I get this to work correctly now. It's awaiting messages, so we're gonna tell Doc we're gonna tell Autobahn to run. Run, Autobahn, run. Ooh, look, it's running test cases. Oh my goodness, it's actually working. It's serving WebSockets. Wow. This is incredible. We'll actually see if I fail any of these tests. I'm hopeful that they pass, but yeah, they could all fail for all I know. <laughs> Thank you, Smack in the Box. <laughs> Your work is done. So, um, some of these are actually taking a long time, though. Oh, these are the performance tests. They do take a second or two sometimes. These are actually taking a lot longer than I think they should take. I'm kind of concerned. These should be a lot fat. Oh, I'm running in debug mode. That's right. Oh, thank you, sir, Flabbergast, and hello. I should, since I have nothing better to do while I wait, I'll, I will, um, wave at people. Hi. Yeah, we're running in the debug build, so it's going to be slow. But I'd re really like to see if I have any test failures. I don't care if they're slow. There are, like, what, 500 of these? But it's the middle ones in, in, in section 9 that are the ones that are going to take the longest. When it gets past section 9, it should speed up again. Aha! We have people from Adam C. Eunice's channel. I see. Welcome. <laughs> should I give you an ACY, ACY high in return? All right. Are we ready to see the test results? Here we go. Ready, ready or not? Oh, we're passing. We're passing. We passed. Yeah, these are not implemented. Oh, we passed everything. Neat. These non-stricts I knew about already. Um, I'm okay with all the non-strict ones. We passed them all. I think we want to run it for performance now. Because it's going to show that these are really dang slow. Right? Where's the one I care about? Um, the round trip. Where's the round trip? 9.7 and 9.8. Yeah, these are abysmal. Um, how would I... I would test this with... Let's let's get a benchmark from Tungstenite. Since I already have that set up to go, I just need another... Um, another shell to serve Tungstenite. So let's... Let's do that. Let's open up another shell. There's a subset of game dev streamers you consider cream of the crop, and you guys all know who you are. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Grumpy game dev. You missed all the painful process to get this working, but now it's all working. Hey, unless you were lurking here. 
crop cream. <laughs> we um, passed the all the tests in the Autobahn test suite on client and server. You're not lurking. So you just got here in the nick of time then. So for the last two hours, 49 minutes, I have been uh, struggling to develop this echo server, which will be hit by the Autobahn test suite. And um, it responds to all fetches by upgrading to a WebSocket and sending those WebSockets over to a worker thread, which serves them. And how we serve a WebSocket is for every ping and pong, we drop it. If it's a text message, we echo it back. If it's a binary message, we echo it back. If it's a close, we're, we have to be careful because if there's a special internal uh, 1005, it's no status. Otherwise, we echo back the code and the reason. Um, this, this is the core of it. We set ourselves up to just run an echo service. And then the Autobahn test suite will ping our echo server with different kinds of uh, input. And it's all talked about here in the, the guys who maintain the Autobahn test suite. I just linked it. Um, a lot of people use it to test their implementation of WebSockets, and I didn't want to be left out of the, cr of, the, of the group. There are so many, they can't keep up with the number of people who use their test suite. Their tester runs in a Docker container, which gave me a little bit of a scare just now in that um, I didn't know how to tell it to connect out of the, um, out of the Docker container and into the, um, the, the host of the Docker container. And then, then I figured out that by using this magical gateway address, we get there. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to be left out of the testing. I'm really happy now because all the tests are passing. Uh, so now I want to pit my implementation against a well-known one in Rust, which is the Tungstenite. Async Tungstenite, right? So they also have an example called Autobahn Server, uh, Autobahn Server, right? I think that's the one we want. Let's just run it. So that's um, cargo run example Autobahn Server. So it should do the same thing mine does. Wait, nope, pack. Did I misspell it? Oh, it needs the feature, yeah. There's a little weird in that you have to, um, you have to enable certain features. Features, async, standard, runtime. I guess it's not technically weird. It's sort of nice that you have to opt into the runtime that you want. So if we oversimplify this, this is a who can pee for this more accurately. Yes, exactly. You got it, Coffee If it's a classic, who can pee the furthest? Actually, it's who can pee the, the quickest. Or if you, if you prefer, it's how many pies can you eat in the pie eating contest. And I just realized that I don't want to run this with the um, debug. Oh, and we can't run it at the same time we're running ours. Only one can only own the uh, socket, right? So I'm going to close ours. And um, I'm going to run this in release build. So run dash dash release example. So it's going to take a little bit of time to... Oh, no, I already built it yesterday. So it should build pretty quick. And now it's running it. Okay, so their server is pretty quiet. Uh, but So let's run the test suite. Uh, I need to close Firefox first. All right, now run the test suite. Here we go. Connection refused. Oh, I wonder if they use a different port number. Oh, wait. They explicitly listed um, the local host address when they bind, right? I think we need to hack that. Let's hack it. So that's VI examples um, Autobahn server, right? I think we need to hack this using VI, of course. I think I need to make the address all zero. If I remember my networking class or my networking stuff. Okay, I hacked it. Let's run it again. And run Autobahn. Here we go. It's running. Successfully hacked. Careful with the words. P keep it PG-13, please. And uh, Automod is sort of uh, a nanny right now. Okay, cool. So we have... Let's look at the Autobahn, um, how fast Autobahn is, and we'll see if we can if we can beat Auto... I mean, uh, not Autobahn. Tungstenite. Um, where's... Where are the results for Tungstenite? Oh, 
Um, I forgot to change the agent name. Shoot. Um, dang it. Okay, so I need to fix that. It's in config sir, uh, fuzzing client. Right, so we need to run it once with... Actually, we can run them simultaneously. Yeah, let's do that. So we're going to run on port... Let's change our port to 9003, because we're better, right? Uh, how do I yank? It's or yank, yank, right? And then paste. That didn't work. I suck at VI. <laughs> um, quote for yank, yank. Oops. I didn't. Ah, abort, abort. Quote for yank, yank. Down, down, down. Quote, paste. I don't know how to do this. Forget it. <laughs> we'll do it with VS Code. All right. I don't know why I was trying to do it with um, VI. I suck at VI. All right. So we're going to run them simultaneously. We will run them for 9003 because we're better. They are um, async tungstenite. All right. So I need to change the... Actually, I had that written in the command line, right? 9003. There we go. Now we're running on port 9003. It's that easy. There's, I had, we had to hard code it. So there's a still running. So I can, um, oh, to be fair, we want to run ours release build, right? So we're going to say run dash dash release Autobahn server 9003. Is the game any further along or did you get stuck in a tar pit? I got stuck in a rusty tar pit, grumpy game dev. Quick, to nano, to nano. I was I was better at VI a long time ago, but I'm not. My skills in VI are rusty. <laughs> yeah, Grumpy Game Dev. I've been just toying around with Rust and really liking it to the point where I kind of want to rewrite the core of my game in Rust before continuing the Game Dev. <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, both servers are ready to be tested, right? I don't know if this is going to test them simultaneously or if it's going to test one after the other, but we'll find out. So this window here is async tungstenite. This window is the Autobahn server, uh, Autobahn testing client, and then that's my server. And I didn't mean to hit that command. I wanted to run that. Okay, so it's hitting tungstenite first. Man, it's fast. I'm scared. I'm scared mine's not going to be fast enough. Okay, it's going through the performance ones in nine. Okay, now it's done. Now it's hitting my server. Actually, my server seems decently fast. Okay, these are, what, timing out or something? I'm scared that mine's going to be slower than Tungstenite. Performance anxiety is perfectly normal. <laughs> okay, it's done. Should we look at the results? I right, here's the results side by side. And... Um, the interesting ones are going to be in 9.6 and 9.7. All right. Hey, not bad. Can I make this bigger so you guys can read it? Look at that. We are on par with tungstenite. We are even faster sometimes. Look at that. We are 8 milliseconds faster for that test case. This one, we're... Um, six milliseconds faster this one we're a little bit slower a little bit slower a little bit tiny bit slower a little bit slower okay we're not always faster but we're on par you know i i like being on par we win sometimes like we won that time we won that time but you know oh what happened i hit oh i clicked on something um we we won that one but we lose that these last two that's okay Let's see, you get down to the sub 50 millisecond level. Differences don't really, really matter. Some of the other folks that have been giving me advice are saying that, especially with compiled Rust release build, that it's so blazing fast that you really need to measure down to the millisecond. There should not be any I.O. blocks in the way. It's all local host. Well, you have to pass the... Docker boundary. I don't know if going in and out of Docker gives a latency, but it'll be fair because the tester client is inside the Docker and both of these guys are outside. They're on equal footing, right? They're both running on the same computer. They're both um, 
using the local host network and the Docker network the same way. And they, um, they're both release build. They're both written in Rust. The only difference is my code versus their code. And um, they're not run simultaneously, so they're not going to interfere with each other. They got to run first, and then we got to run. So it should be pretty fair and pretty fast because there should be no disk I.O. There should be no network I.O. really. It's all inside of memory. Yeah, if this was over a real network, I think we would be happy with these numbers for sure. Um, but when we're in all in RAM, we can maybe hope for better. Wow, we really blew them out of the water on 971. Look at that. 65 milliseconds versus 194. I'm really happy with these numbers. Binary trip round times are excellent. They start to catch up and are a little bit better than us for the larger messages. So I could maybe work on optimizing memory usage for that. And yeah, neither one of us implements the compression. I actually looked into that compression. I thought about doing that. But one problem is I don't have something to test it against. And also it uses um, custom window sizes for LZ77. I don't know how to do that yet. <laughs> the crate I use, which is Flate 2, doesn't let me set a custom window size. So I can't use that. Hey, I'm really happy with this. I think it's time to take a, a victory lap break. I should at least drink some water. Hope you guys all enjoyed this so far. I should also check this in so that you guys can play with it, if you so chose. Let's go to the folder where have all our code in, and um, I never did get Git Cola here. I should probably try to get that. All right. I've been starting to use this new Git GUI called Git Cola, and I don't have it for um, Linux. Do I have to download it? Oh, they have it available through apt-get. Okay, let's try it. Uh, sudo uh, apt-get install git cola. You want my password? All right. Downloading. Downloading while streaming. Very scary. Okay, git cola. Okay. I need to customize it because it's blazing white. Actually, let's hide this because it's scary white. I want dark mode. How do I get that again? That was under um, preferences, wasn't it? Yeah, there was like a... Um, I can't remember now. Like, you know what I should just do is look at the settings I have in Windows and kind of go side by side. So File... Preferences, appearance. Actually, this looks different, doesn't it? This one has an appearance tab, and this one does not. <gasps> I've been cheated. There is no appearance tab in Linux. How could they? So, what does that mean? I can't pick a different theme for Linux? Well, that sucks. Endurin, where are you? <laughs> Endurin is the is the guy who um suggested I try Git Cola. Boo. I wonder if it's because it's an older version. Two point five, okay. Uh version, right? Three point seven. Oh, that's a difference. So this is old. How do we get an old version? Is my Linux distro that old that it gets really old versions of stuff? Okay, well, maybe I'll look into that later. Yeah, I'll just do git GUI then. I'll have to put up with my old um, git client here for a, a bit. Okay, so what did we do? We added the... Whoops. We added the Autobahn ser Echo Server needed to test server mode. I set the default port to 9002 so I should probably also check in instructions on how to run it because I had to figure out a few things oh we didn't handle the specific errors although I guess we didn't really need to right because the 
server is meant to be hit by Autobahn, and Autobahn is always going to generate a proper request, right? It's probably fine to have any error result in a bad request, so maybe that is not really needing to be to do. Oh, I added this junk. Yeah, I don't have unit tests for this either. I need to do that. I need to add unit tests for the start open and the finish open alternate functions for the web server sock web socket server builder. Uh, let's do that first before I check in. Then um, we need to go add some unit tests to web socket builders rs. Sounds like a, sounds like builders are us. Okay, there's initiate open as client. Let's can I just collapse all these and look at them individually? I can. What does complete open as client do? Okay, I get it. Okay, I think I just want an alternate version of complete open as server. So let's call this one complete open as server single call. And the alternate one that tests the um the two call variant that we need for working with my web server. So open a complete open as server two calls. So we, we construct the handshake the same way, but we don't build the mock connection yet. Instead, we're going to do start open, which doesn't require... So this, a lot of this moves, right? Um, pass the response down to here, right? This part is going to start the server side handshake, obtaining the uh, request, no, the response for the request we built. All right, so we don't have a connection yet, right? So start open just takes a request and returns a response. So we don't have the none here either. And do I need to borrow? It does borrow the request, so good. Okay, so then um, we don't have a good WebSocket yet. We just get a response, right? And then we verify the response, and then this is the second call. So um, complete the server side handshake in order to obtain, well, in order to wrap a uh, mocked connection uh, with, well, let's just say complete the server side handshake to obtain the built WebSocket. So that does involve making a mock connection, but this is finish open. And we do, is it finish open or complete open? It's finish open. Right. But it doesn't get a request. It just gets that, right? Cool. And then it's infallible, so we don't need that assert. Instead, we just get the mutex out. Actually, that's just mutable WebSocket. It's infallible. It's infallible! Infallible means that you don't return an error. This never errors out. Okay, so let's just run the test, and then I'll be happy, and I can check it in. Actually, I think I want to run, want to run all my tests just to make sure. Yeah, look at that. It worked. Let's run all my tests, though. Cargo test. Yay, 64 tests passed. I like to see that. Let's check it in. So I'm going to check that in independently of the Autobahn thing, because I think it's it doesn't really matter. Or it's a separate concern, right? This is a separate concern. This is adding to the API set. Should I remove open server? I don't need that anymore, right? I kind of feel like I should. And like force you to go through the builder. I think I will. I think it's redundant and we don't need it. Um, so let's remove it. Let's remove open server. Yeah. It's going away. It's going to be deleted. 
Goodbye, open server. Nothing needed it anyway, right? I can run the test again to make sure. So it was... Oh, wait, wait. Oh, I had unit tests using it. Uh, where? Oh, no, it's just that it was exported. Okay, we don't need to export it anymore. Run those tests again. Run them tests. Okay, good. It was unnecessary. It was dead code. Okay, so then there are two things I did. We added two new APIs for the server builder. No, that's not it. We added two APIs here, start open and finish open. And the single call open now leverages those two, start and finish, right? Which means that old open server API we don't need. Okay, so how that that means the way I want to write this is re, re um add to call variant of server side handshake. And then we're gonna say, well, actually this is one bullet point. I'll need to come up with a summary. One is add to call variant of client ser, server side handshake. The other one is remove open server API client uh, well users should use websocket server builder open instead which now delegates to start and finish open right so let's just say it for a summary What? I had a thought and then I lost it. Uh, let's say um, overhaul server side builder API. There we go. And mostly that's to um, get it to work with my server implementation. So commit that. And oh, that needs to go with it. So append last commit, add this to it. Commit. All right. So this cargo toml change is for the Autobahn example. So that goes with that and we're just going to say add autobahn server example this example is for testing our server websocket implementation against the autobahn test suite well autobahn websocket test suite and I'll for future Raimu or anyone else who cares I will put a link there I also, at some point, let me put a reminder to myself, I need to include instructions on how to do what I did, running, like setting up and running the Autobahn test suite. So to do, include instructions on how to test with the uh, Autobahn uh, test suite. Include in the readme, I guess, instructions on how to test with the Autobahn test suite. Yeah, we should do that. All right. Uh, why is that open anyway? Causing me to scroll. Okay, done with that. Uh, this is commit. Now we're ready to push it. Push that commit. Why does it want my... P oh, because I forgot to run the agent. Uh, let's just do that. SSH add. Now I can get push it. All right, so if you want to see my code that I've been working on today, it's in github.com slash rhymo8354 slash websockets.git. So let's continue. I had some alternate things after we declare victory with Autobahn, and that's what I have here. So an example is to do HTTPS server where we do TLS. Update Rover to include an optional server certificate, which we would need to talk to the example HTTPS server, and then example echo servers and console clients. So I made a console client um, WS talk like years ago, where on the command line you type a text message and it just, just sends it over the WebSocket connection. And then if we combine that with the echo server, then every time everything we type here would be echoed back, right? So yeah, I guess we will do that. I need all these things anyway. I need to make sure that I can get TLS to work with my HTTPS, my HTTP server. I'll need to learn how to use optional server certificates. I don't know how to do that yet. And this will be just useful in general. 
And I essentially already have that in the async tungstenite example. I just need to... Actually, this is... A... Take, take, take it back. This is already done. That's already done. That's the async... That's the uh, Autobahn server, right? What would be the difference? I guess the difference would be we would... No, there's no difference. Yeah, this is already done. So scratch that off. We already made an echo server because that's how we do the Autobahn suite. So I just don't have a console client or TLS stuff. Okay, I'm going to take a quick break though because it's a probably a good stopping point to go use the restroom and all that. So if you've been sitting where you are for the last three and a half, three and a half hours or so like I have, Maybe it's a good time for you to get up and stretch. Just just a suggestion. You don't have to. I'm going to take, uh, I don't know. Actually, I'd really like to eat something, too. It's, off, it's past 4 o'clock, though. Oh, man. And I have to go somewhere. I have to be somewhere virtually in half an hour. You know what? Then instead of taking a break, what I'm going to do is just do this and then call the stream. Yeah, because I, I have to be online for something at 5. All right, so skip. Well, wait. instead of a longer break, I'll take a shorter break just to use the restroom and stretch. So let me set that up. Just like, yeah, like three minutes. Okay, three minute break. I'll be right back. I would just like to know, how did it become 4 in the afternoon already? Shouldn't it be like 2 o'clock? What's the deal? Why is time flying so fast? Okay, I'm going to be making an example HTTP server, uh, S server. So we made Jeeves, which is an HTTP server, and I just need to expand it to be HTTPS now, right? Time is weird like that, yeah. Close everything. Uh, should we move back to Windows? Maybe. Because I'm not going to be needing the Docker thing anymore, right? Yes, yeah, so goodbye, Linux. Hello, Windows. All right, but I need to pull the work I did from the internets back down to Windows. And we'll make sure that it's all working. Cargo test. All right. So, um, why does this show it? Oh, that did get modified. Okay. So I should probably check that in. Cola. Right. Updates to Rust dependencies. Commit. Stage, then commit. I'm glad it reminds me about that. Push. All right, so, um, HTTPS. So the example Jeeves, I wonder if we should just update Jeeves. Right, Jeeves doesn't take any arguments, but we could, for example, we could tell it what um, port, to num port number to use, and then we can tell it whether or not to use a TLS. And then if we told it to use TLS, we need to give it a certificate, right? So yeah, let's do that. 
I want to then pull in um, Structop. Structop is a handy little crate which handles command line arguments for you. In Rust, you define the structure for what your arguments look like. So we're going to just take a leaf out of what Rover does. Yeah, so this is how we get our arguments. So back in Jeeves, this should do the same thing. And then our options, we need to define a structure which embodies our command line arguments. And I'll do that here. And what are our command line arguments? Well, first of all, I forgot to pull instruct op into our namespace. So let's do that. Now that we've done that, our options, uh, I don't have a U. I want a port number, right? Just similar to the test I made before. And I learned that these are all strings. So this will be a port, which will be parsed as a U16, but it's um, a string when it's on the command line. And um, that way I can replace this with ops.port. And let's test that. Uh, terminal. Cargo run example Jeeves 8082. Okay, so then I can point my local web browser to HTTP localhost 8082. Uh, why did it not work? Why is it stalled? Why is What's wrong with Chrome? What are you unhappy with, Chrome? It did connect. Chrome isn't happy, though. What's wrong, Chrome? I don't get it. Localhost 8082. It's... And now it's not even connecting at all. What did I do wrong? Is it just... Chrome that's having a problem? Okay, we don't need this anymore. Let me try with Firefox real quick. Okay, there's something else. It... I must be doing something wrong on my server where it's not... It's not making the web browser happy. <laughs> um, okay, well maybe... In, should I figure that out first? How would I figure that out? I'd probably use I'd probably use Chrome to do this, but I put it I I need to put the uh dev dev options on. All right, and then we're going to show everything. So all and then we'll go to http colon localhost 8082. Why is it not getting a response back? I don't get this. Why would it get a... Does the server only set WebSocket? No. This Jeeves should just say um, 404 not found, actually. If we said slash foo, it would say something. Oh. Maybe I didn't do the 404 handler right. That might be it. <laughs> I might, I didn't test that. Um, this is a locally generated 404, but let's let me get the 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 path has has to be corrected. Slash foo. Okay, there we go. Hello world. So I must not have done the 404 handler correctly. So if I do just that, it says pending. Okay, so um, yeah, I must have messed up the 404 handler. Let's do that. Let's fix that first. <laughs> Um, that would be deep in the server, right? Actually, you know what? There ought to be like a 404 handler we can register. But for now, let's have a default in the server. So that would be... It's probably marked as a to-do. Uh, it, it's not here, right? It's where we um, handle a connection. Yes. It's in this else. So we do set a 404. Why does this not work? Why you no work? Oh, 
This should have sent back 404 not found. What am I missing here? Is it that we don't have a content length? Do I need to set a content length zero? Is that what it's waiting for? Anyway, um, it should have generated and sent it. I, I don't know. I'm going to guess that maybe that's what it is. So we'll say... Um, response dot headers wait what no suggestions why not why no suggestions here i don't get it anyway i guess i'll just type it it's headers dot set i don't know why the suggestions weren't working there now it's now it's working again content length a uh, string from zero. Actually, do I even need to say string from? I don't. Nice. Okay. Uh, let's try that. And reload. I think I got a response here that time. No. It didn't. Uh, let me... How do I clear? Is there's a garbage can somewhere, right? No. Clear. There we go. R run again. Okay, so... Oh, right, because there is no response. Okay, so I guess that's the problem then. We need to say content lane zero. I'm surprised, though, that we need to say that. Oh, we're, are we missing some other header here? There's like a minimum set of headers that a s server is supposed to include, and I think we need to add that. Uh, well, how would I find this out? <laughs> Google search? Uh, let's look in the HTTP RFC. Uh... It always brings me to this one, but that's not the right one. I want 7230. Uh, they should list here like required headers for servers, right? Maybe it is the other RFC. I don't know. Uh, let me check the other one then. What? Does this 7231 say? Response header fields? I'm going to get lost in this really soon. Yeah, I'm already lost. Um... I don't want to take too much time like trying to skim through that, so I'm going to look up our HTTP server required headers. Someone's got to have talked about this, right? Here we go. What is response headers are required? There are no header fields that must be sent with every response, no matter what the circumstances are, but there are header fields that you really should send. The only header field that comes close is date, but even it has circumstances under which it's not required. In the parlance of that, which one is that? Keywords for use in RFCs. To, oh, right. In their language, they're saying the term must means that something is a requirement, blah, blah, blah. There are no header fields defined by any of those that must be sent by Norger in all cases. The Norwegian server must not send date if it does not have a clock capable. Okay. Must send a date field in all other cases. So if we don't set a date, if we don't send a date, we're basically admitting that we don't have a clock. <laughs> so I probably should set the date, correct? But is it, what date is it? Is it the current date or is it the date of the resource? Orders or may generate a server field in response. content length aside from the absence of transfer coding orders should send a content length when the payload body size is known. 
On the subject of content length, the transfer recording, note that neither can be sent, in which case the length of the response is determined by the number of octets received prior to the... Oh, right. We didn't close the connection, so that's why it was sitting there hanging. Firefox and Chrome were assuming that we might send until we disconnect, and we didn't disconnect. Oh, uh -huh, okay. So that's why setting the content length to zero worked around that. Okay. An origin server that does not support persistent connections. Yeah, we know that. An origin server must generate and allow in a 405 not allowed response. Must send authenticate for unauthorized. Okay, so we're pretty much good. We should probably think about setting the date. And we should have a content type. Well, but 404, we're not going to have any content. Ser we should set server. Okay, so I'm thinking about adding server and date then. So I suppose we would look at those definitions. Oh, it's nice that they linked them. All right, let's look at server. Server identifies information about the software used by the origin server to handle the request. Okay, so it's like the user agent, only it's on the server side. Okay, so I think we should just leave that up to the example then. We'll just say server Jeeves 1.0 or some, something like that, right? All right. How is a comment formatted? Uh, I just got lost. Oh, no, I'm lost. Okay, go back. It says section 3.2. Header fields. So in here somewhere it talks about, I don't know where it is. Never mind that. Okay, should not generate one containing unneedlessly fine-grained detail. Should limit the addition of subproducts by third parties. Okay, so... We'll just keep it simple. Just say server is Jeeves. So um, we would do that on all responses, correct? So then, um, so really, um, we should be doing that as a configuration of the server, right? Uh, do we give that in new? If I give it in new, that implies that we can't change it after we start the server. Is that okay? Otherwise, I might use a set which would make it more complicated because these are served from a worker thread context, so we would have to ship it in somehow. Let's just keep it simple. Excuse me, so it would just be like Jeeves. And then new would take a um, server name. That's what they call it, right? Server information. Server info. Uh, T where... Um, T is something that we can convert into a string. Actually, why don't we be even nicer and say it's a cow? Uh, where's where's cow again? Where's the cow? Moo. It's in borrow. Okay. Well, let's just say cow. And then we'll import cow from standard borrow, right? Standard borrow cow. It's the borrowing cow. Okay. Um, what's wrong with that? Oh, um, then it's not generic, is it? It's just that. Non-generic. Okay. So then I would just pass it along to the worker thread, wouldn't I? I think so. So then this server info propagates into the worker thread. So we add the cow there, add, add it there. What's wrong with that? Explicit alighted lifetime not allowed here. What? Oh, implicit alighted lifetime not allowed here. What's, what lifetime am I al aligning? This one? No. I don't get it. <laughs> Maybe I don't understand cow enough to use this here. Uh, 
HTTP server cargo clippy. What's the deal? Oh, w wacky. We have to do that? Interesting. Okay. And then somewhere where I call new, I have to call... I have, yeah, okay. Wacky, I didn't know I need... I had to do that. Uh, what just... What was that pop-up that I dismissed right away? Oh, I broke something. Oh. Wrong character there. I think I broke the language server. Okay. Anyway. I think it's going to have a trouble with that lifetime, right? So I think I want to do a move here. No? What's the deal then? Explicit lifetime required in the type of server info. Static required. Oh, do I need to say, um, static? Okay, then I don't understand cow. Maybe I need to research cow. I don't, I didn't know it had another template argument like that. It does. What does it mean? B is constrained to be, it has to implement owns, it doesn't need to be sized, and... Oh no, it can be become owned. It doesn't have to have a size and it is no, lives no longer than some other lifetime A. What is that lifetime? So I guess normally it's alighted, but what does it mean? Oh. So it's an enum and that alighted lifetime is the reference that you gave it. Then why is what's the second re lifetime for oh the other one's not a not a lifetime oh okay okay so it's the same lifetime has to appear in both places normally we can alight it but i guess we couldn't in this case okay okay we're all good so then um for here the default what do we provide for it i guess we can't implement default because we need to provide something so sorry default i probably screwed up all my unit tests no i, I don't have unit tests for server so i just screwed up jeeves how are you all right, uh, you have to do into to make a string slice go into, uh, that won't work, what? Um, what? I don't understand that at all. Examples. Uh, yeah. It's not the trait convert from string slice is not implemented is not implemented for a cow how did i get this to work before is it the static lifetime um now i'm second guessing myself using cow <laughs> Okay, they say use cow from. Okay, we can do that. Cow from. And we don't have cow here, so that's cow, uh, borrow cow. Okay, this is still a problem, probably for the same reason. Yes. Why? Does it not like that? That is a static lifetime string. I don't get this. I must not understand this lifetime A correctly. Is it a subset of lifetime of B? Maybe? I don't get it. Has someone written how to use a cow? <laughs> how to use Rust 
cow. Um, yeah. Here we go. Uh, this is too bright. Let's turn on Dark Reader for this guy. Okay. Some of the first Russian code. Wrote this, yeah, blah, 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 blah. Uh, yeah, I'm impatient. I'm an impatient reader, so I'm trying to skim through it. Oh, here we go. Cow to the rescue. Yes, this is what I want. Lifetime A and subtype B. B is constrained to A to own size. A. B cannot contain a lifetime shorter than A. B cannot contain a shorter lifetime than A. Okay. A reference to some object of type B. The lifetime of this reference is the same as the lifetime bound. Got that part. We want to have a cow A string, which looks something like this after type substitution. In short, cow A will be their string for the lifetime A or V string, which is not bound by that lifetime. Sounds great for the token type. Yeah. Okay, why did they have to make it all generic, though? Oh, into cow, then I don't have to say cow own. Okay. The lifetime bound on token is no longer a problem for escaping stack frames when created with or a string. Um, okay. Then why did I have to, um, okay, let's go back to this. Why did I have... Just say static there again. It has to do with sending it across across threads, I think. Add explicit lifetime static to the type of server info. All right, but then that causes um, Jeeves to fail with. That the lifetime that the lifetimes don't match. Ah, uh, do I have to be explicit here? This sounds this seems really stupid to me. Expected enum borrow cow found reference static string. Uh, say what again? Oh, um, do I need to put that there? No. What's what's the deal with this? I think it has to do it does have to do with that, right? Can I just say that? Ah, uh, sh this is really annoying. <laughs> I don't know what to do. Okay, forget the cow. Uh I am already done with cows. I've had enough cows. I've had enough of cows today. So um we'll just we'll just say it needs to go um some t where we need to be able to put t into a string. Cuz ultimately let's just make a copy of it. So um why don't we just convert it to a string here before we send it off to the other thread? And then that means that this can just take a string. And then everyone's happy. No, everyone's not happy. What's going on here still? I didn't send it safely. Oh, wait, um, because of that. So first we need to say let's... We need to turn it into a string first before we make that closure. I wonder if that's the what the problem was with the cow, too. And the, the uh, compiler just couldn't tell me that. Okay, anyway, um, we have that server info, and where does it need to go next? Handle connections, right? Server info. Oh, but um, uh, let's have it borrow it at this point. And, yeah, otherwise I'm going to have trouble with it owning 
uh, owning it and then it gets moved. Thank you for the follow. I appreciate that. So a borrowed string you get. Um, yes. Wait, the Xandal connections in two places? Oh, connections. Like I had that in the wrong place. It actually needs to be in both places, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay, so it needs to be in both places. I just jumped the gun there. Uh, handle connections, plural. It goes there, too. All right, so then... Um, this... Oops. Okay, that, that's going to require that I change a bunch of... Dang it. You know, this is changing too much stuff. I'm, I'll have to do it eventually, but this is this is a can of worms because now I have to make this a structure that has the connection and the um, server info. Unless I put it somewhere else. No, there's nowhere else to put it. All right, well, I guess we'll just open that can of worms. So... The, um, we'll just make a type struct um, connection info or connection I don't know what, I, I need a better name there for now it's just going to be the connection is that box connection and then we have the server info which is a um, can I do this or am I going to regret that if I do that I need to assign it a lifetime, right? Which means I do that. I'm probably going to regret this, because then we can't send that across a channel. Yeah, this is... We'll have to clone it. I hate doing this, though. There's got to be a different way. It would have to do with... Borrowing... It would be like a ref cell, right? That we would copy... Or, no, not a ref cell. A... Um, We'd have to have a reference kind of thing that we can share that has all the constants that live as long as the server or live for a static lifetime, right? For now, we'll just clone it. Am I jumping ahead too quick? I'm going to make more mistakes this way. Maybe. I might want to postpone this work until tomorrow because I only have eight minutes left. Um. Okay, think. I'll put this in here for now. It's not too much to take out later. So this is a connection info now. So error-driven development, right? So when we get down to here, I need to bundle... Okay, so this... Except next connection needs the server info also. Arc is a... Asynchronous reference counted. So it's like a smart pointer, like a shared pointer in C++. Shared pointer. Yeah, basically it's you can share it between threads and um, as long as you guarantee they don't step on each other like th th using a mutex, usually you put a mutex inside of an arc if you're going to share it across threads. I uh, And then, like I was saying before, a lot of these arc mutexes I might not even need. It it's This is sort of like, I've been using this as a band-aid when I can't get, um, when I can't get sharing between tasks working immediately and I kind of jumped to that. I need to revisit it because I probably don't need all those wrappers. But they... The worst they can do is maybe um, add an extra adapter wrapper that I didn't actually need. So it might make... It might add an extra level of indirection we don't need and make it a little bit slower. But I don't care about speed. I just want to make it work right now. I'll come back and I'll... And I need to leave some work for myself to do in the future, right? Um, yeah, so I need server info because we need to include that here so this is um connection info with a connection and server info inside and um is this going to be shared i don't remember but um this definitely will need to be cloned server info because it needs its own copy of it Wait, what? Is this thing... 
Oh, this is what comes out of the chin. Okay, so I did this wrong. <laughs> this is just connection. Uh, this thing is a connection info. Which means I don't need that server info after all. It's all in there. So um, this connection gets... Right. The connection info is a connection info. Which means I don't need that there. Okay, so then... Um, connection info dot connection? That's... Okay, right? Yes. All right, and then following the trail of compiler errors. This needs to be um, connection infos. Right? And then keep, keep going. So the connection sender needs to be the right type. I think that's why it doesn't like that. Yes, this has to be in connection info again. All right, and then um, here's where I make it, right? Except, okay, except connections doesn't have server info. Here we go. Does that mean that handle connections doesn't actually need it? Yeah, it didn't need it. It's, this is not necessary. Handle connections doesn't need server info. It's except connections does. All right, so everyone's happy. No, not everyone's happy. We have one here. All right, so here's where we bundle together the information we have, right? So it's connection info, connection, and then server info is server info dot clone. I'm waiting for the language server to catch up. Okay, it caught up. Now we have some warnings to deal with. Never actually used. Yeah, we're not using it yet. What's the deal here? Oh, I suppose that could be a slice. Yeah. And then instead of that, it's just string from. Okay. And we never used cow because I couldn't get cow to work because I don't know how to use cow yet. Okay, so then um, we just need to use the server info. And that was in handling a request, right? Yeah. Uh, where is that exactly? Getting lost in my own code, which means I probably need to re split this code up a bit. Okay, here we go. So, um... When we get the response back at, so here we should add it. Um, add standard headers. So response.headers.setHeaderServer server info. That was available through connection info. No. Oh, we moved it. Where do we move it? Oh, that moves it. Oh, shoot. Um, dang it. Uh, I need to do a let. Let. How does this work? I need to destructure that connection info. Can you destructure it this way? Or am I getting my languages confused? <laughs> I think I am. I don't think you can do that, right? Which is a bummer. Um, yeah, when we do that, we're we're moving out of a structure which we can't do. But I can borrow it. No, I can't. Dang it. This.
I can take it out of there. That's what I should do. So this should be take. Uh, mark this as mutable and we can do that. Uh, I thought I could do that. Oh, is this not an option? It's not an option. Dang it. <laughs> um, okay. I painted myself into a corner. I need to wrap that one into an option, but I need the string elsewhere. So what the heck am I going to do? The string I only need to borrow. What if... Can I borrow that here? Let's server info equal connection info dot connection. Or... Okay, maybe that'll work. And just use server info there. Trait bound is not satisfied in... What? What's it telling me? Hold on a second. Dry throat. Is this type? Do I have the wrong type here? I have the wrong type there. Dang it. Uh, this should be server info. Okay. Fixed it. <laughs> I had the, totally the wrong thing. You can destruct. You want to borrow the server info, not the connection, right? Well, I wanted to basically destructure. I want to pull these things out because I want to put that into an option and I want to borrow that. But so borrowing it, it out is fine. I think that's okay as long as um, this is also a bar. Uh, well, this moves out of connection info, right? I probably can't reverse those two. Oh, I can do that? Yeah, okay, so there's some things I still don't quite get. Uh, thank you for the follow. I thought I was going to run into trouble borrowing something inside of a structure and then basically moving something else out. But I guess it's tracking that correctly, right? Maybe because we own it. Since we own it, we can do stuff like that and get away with it. Let connection info connection equal. Oh, you can do that? Oh, that's even better. So, this, right? That equals connection info. We never use connection info again. So, this becomes connection. And then uh, it doesn't like this one because it was moved in the previous iteration, but if I borrow it, it should be fine. Perfect. Okay, yeah. You can destructure, I just didn't know how. Sir Mordred, thank you very much for helping me out there. It works. We can destructure structures. All right, that's exactly what I wanted. Okay, so now when I run the server... Build, build, build. I'm going to have to call it here because I'm needed elsewhere on the internet. We'll have to do the rest of this tomorrow. So now when I um, load here, we'll get a server Jeeves there. That was all that that was for. <laughs> but I'm learning a valuable lesson. Um, when I send these connections around my tasks, I didn't leave room to attach extra things besides the TCP connection. So some of that information might be server-wide or it might be connection-specific. So I'm going to maybe need to work on that a little bit more. Um, what was the other thing I was going to add at the same time? It was date, right? That's more complicated than I want to deal with. I think I'm going to hold off on that. I'm just going to check this in. Uh, we're in WebSockets, Git Cola. Yeah, I'm going to have to end the stream because I am needed elsewhere on the net. Actually, I'm going to go fishing. Uh, am I in the wrong repository? I am. I'm playing Raft with another streamer, actually. Okay, so we're adding struct op so that we can read in command line arguments and write. I'm using... I don't need to use cow there. Yeah, it, that's what that warning is about, right? I don't need cow there. So I should have no problems now. Oh, what's this? Oh, that broke. 
Ah, WebSockets broke because we need to give it an agent here. Um, Autobahn. Well, no, this is the name of our server, so this would be. Um, I don't know what I want to. What, what I want to. What do I want to put here? Rimu WebSockets. It's for now. Just a placeholder. Sure. No problems. Okay. Cargo test. Actually, let's run it from the root directory. Cargo test while I do check-ins. So all I did here was make the port configurable on the command line and include the server name. So Jeeves, make port number configurable on command line HTTP server provide server information to new okay so this is like work in progress expand uh, adding features to HTTP server I'm in the habit now of putting th proper names in backticks I don't know if that's a good habit or a bad one okay so all of these go together right Commit that. Garbage collect and push it. And then I needed that broke web sockets because that needs to provide a server info. So provide a server info for HTTP server. Good. Push that one. And this changed dependencies. So, update Rust dependencies because we're running, we're using struct op now. Git push overall status, and then, um, yeah, check to make sure all my tests pass. I think they did. Yep, I don't see any test failures after we got rid of those warnings, so that's good. Okay, leaving it in a good state for tomorrow. All right, so thank you all for watching. Let me try to find someone. Let's see if someone else is doing Rust. If you're watching me, you're probably interested in Rust, or maybe you just want to watch another dev coder or just listen to someone else with a good voice. I understand that. <laughs> um, I'm in Team Rust Stations, so I'm going to see if someone else is... Oh, we have two people in Team Rust Stations also going... I don't know this streamer. Uru Uru Ni Niwa. Oh, they were in my stream before. What are they doing? Dwarf Fortress like Rust plus GGEZ. Bye, Sir Flabbergast. I hope you um, had fun watching. Yeah, I'll be over in Ski Dog's channel playing Raft shortly. Um, it doesn't look like they're actually doing Rust. They're looking at a Wikipedia page. Okay. I don't know if I want to raid that person then. Okay, let me look elsewhere. <sighs> hmm. Ooh, how about Zorkenheimer? He's always fun to watch. He's been going, going for an hour and a half, so he's probably going to keep going. Okay, I like Zorkenheimer, so I hope you like Zorkenheimer too. He likes to program assembly language and Golang for Nintendo emulation. So he makes Nintendo games, if you can believe it. Pretty fun guy and very knowledgeable, and you'll learn a lot about assembly language. And apparently Go, he's doing Golang today. So this will be fun. Let's start this raid. Zorkenheimer. Start raid. Anyway, I should be back tomorrow unless something comes up. Hope you guys, I hope you all have fun watching Zorkenheimer's channel, and I will see you next time. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.